Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Live Smart Texas World Obesity Day Summit. My name is Leah Wiggum. I'm co-chair of Live Smart Texas, along with Dr. Emily Durander. We're excited to be here today with you to present our first ever World Obesity Day Summit, brought to you by both Live Smart Texas and Partnership for Healthy Texas. Live Smart Texas is a coalition of organizations and individuals who work together to address the state's obesity epidemic, especially in children. You can reach us at the contact information below. If you are interested in tweeting today, please tag at Live Smart Texas. You can also tag me at Leah Wiggum. And we're here today because March 4th is World Obesity Day. The mission of World Obesity Day is to increase awareness of obesity as a disease, encourage advocacy, improve policies, and share experiences. Obesity is a complex and chronic disease. This infographic from the Obesity Society illustrates the more than 100 potential contributing factors that we currently know of. Factors that impact the energy intake and energy expenditure of an individual. Everything from genetic, biological, medical, and physiological factors to behavioral and environmental factors related to foods, beverages, and physical activity, as well as economic and social factors. If you're interested in a copy of this infographic, you can find it on the Obesity Society website. Because of these complexities, in order to impact obesity in Texas, we will have to address it from three, three different perspectives. With strategies that involve both programs, changes to the environment, and policies that support health. These three perspectives, the clinical treatment and management of obesity, healthy food and physical activity, all need to be addressed with strong evidence-based programs. Those programs need to use the strongest behavioral science methodology so that we can ensure to impact psychosocial factors. We also need strategies that, that impact the environment in which people live and work and spend their lives day to day and policies that support those healthier environments and strong programs. The strategies for each of these three perspectives vary. For example, to ensure access to clinical treatment and management of obesity, healthcare providers need support. There are not enough obesity specialists in the country or in the state of Texas to adequately fill the need of the millions of people who have overweight or obesity. So we need to support primary care providers who are the first line healthcare workers that can help people address this chronic disease that they face. But the barriers for healthcare providers, especially primary care, primary care providers, are many. They have limited time, so we need to ensure that they have time efficient tools that they can use at low cost. They need to be reimbursed when they, when they have appointments with patients. They need reimbursement for the care that they're providing for treatment and management of obesity rather than waiting to reimburse them for downstream chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and the multitude of other complications that come with obesity. And we need access to treatment options that are affordable, which includes behavioral therapy, pharmacotherapy, and surgical options when medically appropriate. With regards to healthy food, we need to address this from several different perspectives. We need to ensure that people are food secure, that they have enough money to purchase healthy foods through programs like WIC and SNAP that support the most vulnerable members of our populations. We need availability of food where people live, not far from their homes, easy to access and affordable. We need healthy foods in schools and childcare settings, and we need to support those, those staff who work in those settings to make sure they have the tools, the training, 
and the funding to provide that healthy food to our children. With regards to physical activity, we need to make sure that within our schools and our early child care settings, we have strong policies and programs for physical education and recess. We need safe and convenient opportunities for active transportation for kids getting to and from school by walking, riding bikes, using active forms of transportation, and for adults within their daily routines. We need accessible and affordable sports, accessible to all children of all abilities, all ages, with a focus on play, not on competition. And our keynote speaker is going to address that in a few moments. So today we've got a very exciting program for you. We'll build some breaks in throughout the day. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing first from our keynote speaker, Tom Ferry, who will be talking about his work as executive director of the Sports and Society Program at the Aspen Institute, which is dedicated to improving the world through sports. He founded the Sports and Society Program to convene leaders, facilitate dialogue, and inspire solutions that can help sports serve the public interest. Two years later, Project Play, its signature initiative, was launched to help stakeholders build healthy communities. Following our keynote presentation, after a short break, we will have some quick presentations from our Live Smart Texas Steering Committee members from different regions of Texas. They will share how their communities are addressing the obesity epidemic throughout the state. Following that presentation, we will hear from our partners through Partnership for Healthy Texas. A panel of Texas leaders will share highlights from the State of Obesity in Texas report that was recently released and discuss issues and some policy solutions for addressing the obesity crisis in this volatile time. The panelists will include Dr. David Lakey from the UT system, State Representative Dr. Alma Allen, and Patricia Garza, the principal of the Solomon Ortiz Elementary School. To wrap us up at the end of the session today, we will hear from Dr. Deanna Halsher, the Regional Dean of the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin, She'll close out the day with a presentation on the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Survey. She's the principal investigator of the Texas FAN Survey, which is funded by the Texas Department of State Health Services. This study established a surveillance system to monitor the prevalence of overweight and obesity in school-aged children in Texas and has been conducted since 2000. She's going to present the latest data from that study. So thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoy all the presentations that we've prepared. And I'm now gonna turn it over to our keynote speaker, Mr. Tom Ferry. Well, thank you, Dr. Wiggum. Uh, real, real pleasure to be here with all of you uh, and to be part of this uh, important day in conversation. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm Tom Ferry, uh, Executive Director of the Sports Society Program at the Aspen Institute. We are, if you're not familiar with Aspen, it's a, a not-for-profit educational and policy studies group based out of Washington, D.C., but we have an international presence. We do work in every state in the country. Um, in my program, which is one of about 25 or so programs at the Institute, uh, is focused entirely on sports. And specifically, um, about 95% of our work to date has been on something called uh, Project Play. And so that, that's what I'm going to talk to you about here. Um, you know, what we've learned through Project Play, and as you think about um, how to uh, build a healthier uh, Texas, um, perhaps there's some learnings uh, that we can, uh, we can share with you that might be, might be useful. So let me just dive in here, I have a few, few slides. So the first thing you need to know about Project Play is uh, well, it was for it was it was launched in 2013 um, with the mission of helping stakeholders build healthy communities through sports. Um, I'm a former ESPN investigative journalist and uh, wrote a book back in 2008 called "Game On: The All American Race to Make Champions of Our Children," which was really a journalistic survey of the landscape of youth sports in America that tried to understand, you tried to explain how we became the world sports superpower but also had one of the worst obesity crises out there. What is it about our sports system that um, 
put some kids on a fast track, um, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, concussions, ACL injuries, et cetera. And yet so many kids were also left on the couch. Why were so many being pushed aside, locked out, shut out from the sport experience at a very early age? And so, you know, that the writing of that book and the laying out of the problem led to the, the creation of Project Play, I mean, like I said, in 2013, partnered with the Aspen Institute um, and uh, used their reach into um, a lot of thought leadership circles, uh, networks that I didn't have necessarily have as a sports journalist. And so I could get all the right people around the table to say, how do we build a better sports system in this country? One that is uh, accessible to all children, regardless of zip code or ability. Um, and then how can you know we uh, introduce them to sport activity that uh, they would stay engaged with um, or develop healthy habits, active habits uh, as they move into the adult years. Um, so, you know, it's a big bite uh, and we tried uh, not to boil, you know, all of the ocean at one time. And so we started at the base at 12 and under and really asked, uh, you know, the, the thought leaders, the policy leaders, uh, a range of experts that uh, came around our series of roundtables. Um, how do we get it right at 12 and under? How do we, you know, make sure, you know, how do we get every kid off the couch without running them into the ground? Um, and so it was, it, that's really been the focus of our work to date. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about sort of the new layers of project play. But uh, the 12 and under has been uh, really the, 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 the lion's share of our, has gotten the lion's share of our attention so far. So step one in the process is, is just uh, is organizing the knowledge, right? You can't just like mobilize people around uh, to go change things unless they unless they know what needs to be changed and they understand the complexity of the system that you're trying to change right and, um you know from the moment a child wakes up to the moment uh they go to sleep uh, they uh, there are any number of institutions that touch the lives of children parents uh, the schools uh community recreation groups uh, tech and media they're on they're on this thing, they're getting all sorts of messaging uh, through there. Um, you know, uh, policymakers and civic leaders, how they, how they draw, you know, urban design, our parks nearby, et cetera. So, you know, it's changing something, addressing a, a topic like obesity, as Dr. Wiggum mentioned, is extremely complex. And if you're going to design solutions, uh, you really need to do your due diligence ahead of time to understand. Um, you know, where the gaps are, uh, where the opportunities are, and then package it all together into a framework that uh, the stakeholders can rally around. So the first thing we did uh, was aggregate the knowledge. Um, and we worked with, uh, uh, this actually came from a project called Design to Move uh, that the American College of Sports Medicine and Nike and other partners um, uh, got started uh, just prior to, to Project Play. And it took the stacks and stacks of, of academic research um, on the, that looked at the value of uh, physical activity and sport activity uh, in um, producing healthy lives and, and put together in, this, in, this, in a simple infographic that anybody can use. I mean, feel free to use this in your research. We found it very effective at uh, bringing um, uh, unlikely actors into uh, the conversation. They begin to see the value, uh, the value proposition of, of, of addressing uh, the lack of uh, physical activity. So you can see here that kids who are physically active are one tenth as likely to be obese. They do better in school. They smoke less. Uh, girls have lower pregnancy rates. Uh, they're more likely, kids are more likely to go to college. Uh, there are lower levels of depression and uh, self-derogation, higher levels of self-esteem. Uh, they go on to make more money. Uh, they have lower health care costs. They're more productive at work. And then they have reduced risk of uh, heart disease, stroke. Um, I forget the number exactly. It's 15, 20 different types of cancer, I mean, uh, 13 times, many types of cancer. Let's just leave it at that. And diabetes. Um, and then they're more likely to be active parents 
and as active parents, they're role models for their kids. So they're more, more, their kids are more likely to be uh, to be active. So again, this virtuous cycle can be engaged if you can simply get kids off the couch without running them into the ground, which can't wait, or it's very hard to wait until to, to introduce physical activity. If you wait till kids are you know, 15, 16, if they're in high school or even beyond, um, it can be done and, and those are worthy efforts, but the real opportunity is to build those healthy lifestyles at a very early age. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is research that we put front and center in, in Project Play. And, as you think about uh, attacking uh, the issue of obesity in, in Texas, um, whether it be you know, this infographic, if it's helpful, again, feel free to grab it. You may want to develop your own where you aggregate the research where people at a glance can get it. It can be very, very effective at getting the right folks around the table and then developing shared solutions. We also made the argument that uh, beyond an individual impact on, on kids, uh, that active communities do better. So this is something that we put together last year. It's what the research shows on the benefits to residents. So you can see that physically active communities, meaning those that invest in parks and recreation, um, are, are, you know, people are less likely to smoke. Again, they, they have uh, better obesity uh, outcomes, lower rates of obesity, heart disease. Uh, they're more likely to have a higher uh, active uh, biking and walk scores in town, better average air quality. So there's a climate climate action piece to this. And they have higher property values. I mean, this is, you know, active communities where people are out and about riding bikes, walking, talking with each other. Um, these are the places where people want to live. Um, and, and, you know, the closer, you know, homes are to parks, the more valuable they are. So, you know, uh, this is an important um, slide uh, infographic in bringing mayors and city managers uh, and policymakers into the conversation. Um, we know that sport and recreation are supported by, uh, by wide margins, by Democrats and Republicans. It's something that we believe public recreation is, is worth investing in. So, um, so, so the audience is there. So how do you get the information then to bring them into this conversation and develop policies and invest in urban design and so forth uh, that are going to be valuable. Um, so step two is really then, then, then building a playbook, a framework um, that all safety, you know, all eight sectors that touch the lives of children can wrap around. Um, and so this was ours. This came out in 2015 after doing a lot of listening for two years. It's called Sport for All, Play for Life, a playbook to get every kid in the game the nation's first cross-sector framework for action for youth sports, ages 12 and under. And we were very clear about the values that underpin this thing, which are health, meaning, you know, is the activity that is being encouraged in here uh, producing positive individual health outcomes and public health outcomes. Um, and inclusion, meaning is the sport activity in there being uh, uh, promoted activity uh, that which is available to um, all kids, uh, as opposed to just the kids from the upper income homes or the kids who are, you know, the early emerging athletes who get, get cherry pick the play on the travel teams and, and, and chase and chase championships. Um, again, it was it was informed by input from 300 leaders, and then there were 40 uh, tactical ideas that we pushed out to each of those eight sectors, saying, okay, you want to you want to plug in. Here's some ideas you can run with right now. Go develop tools, introduce policies, uh, unlock certain types of grant making. Uh, so anyway, this has been the seminal uh, report of Project Play and everything we've done from our state of play reports, and I'm gonna talk about all this stuff, everything is through this architecture of the, uh, of the eight plays. And so we named those eight sectors as well. I mean, you know, sport, for instance, it can be perceived as if kids are not playing, it can be perceived as just, you know, something community recreation groups need to do a better job of. But park and recs, they can't do it alone. YMCAs can't do it alone. Boys and girls and clubs, girls and club, boys and girls clubs can't do it alone. Uh, you need everybody basically singing off the same uh, song sheet. So that means, uh, you know, Tied to our vision here of an American which all children should be active through sports. 
uh, that means national sport organizations have a role, business and industry in terms of you know what they sponsor, uh, what they support, tech and media in terms of the messaging that they get pushed out, uh, 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 public health, uh, which includes foundations and the healthcare sector, um, education. So the schools obviously play a real role in all this through PE, recess, uh, school-based sports, um, uh, policymakers and civic leaders. And the parents, of course, who are the gatekeepers, or they're the ones who originally signed kids up for uh, for for sports programs, and you know they're the ones who they put too much pressure on kids uh, to perform or don't, and 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 uh, really facilitate uh, an experience that is going to be uh, you know uh, child centered. Um, they have parents have the ability to advocate for what good looks like in youth sports if they simply know what questions to ask. Of themselves, their child, and their local sport provider. Many of them don't. So we've created resources, uh, free resources. All of our resources have been free uh, for them to for them to do that. We also said, okay, there are eight strategies here, right? So let's let's focus on these these things. And none of them are rocket science, and they're not supposed to be rocket science. They're meant to uh, be nice, tight descriptions of what we call plays or uh, ways for stakeholders to mobilize around the framework. Look at them in a glance, get it, get heads nodding, so they can go off and create partnerships and uh, products and policies uh, that are shared and, uh, and make sense. So the first uh, strategy in our, in our framework is ask kids what they want, right? Uh, and this is gonna be important for you as you think about how to attack obesity issues. In youth sports, we know they're called youth sports, but they're really designed by adults for adults, um, often well-meaning adults. But it's not like when the Little League board you know, draws up the season structure and you know, are they going to travel and swag and uh, you know priorities. It's not like kids are sitting at this table. Um, it's a bunch of usually dads. Uh, applying what they think uh, youth sports ought to be in their town. And then we wonder why kids, we have such a high attrition rate in youth sports. We know that you know, uh, kids um, in pretty much every sport, the average kid drops out by age 11 and plays only 2.9 years. So uh, you know, youth sports get these kids and they've used, they, they lose a lot of them really, really quickly. And we wonder why, and it's because we're not bringing the voice of children into the design of these experiences and these solutions. Kids standing in right field, the touch of the ball four times during the game, maybe three times, sitting on the bench half the game, uh, not a great experience, you know? We wring our hands at the video game companies, um, you know, why our kids spend so much time playing Madden or FIFA, whatever else it may be. But what the video game companies do is they, uh, they pay attention to their consumer. They, they see what works, they, they monitor the data, they adjust their product constantly, and then they ultimately create uh, competition environments that are going to serve the needs of, of kids. You know, sports sociologists will tell you that kids want action, they want access to the action, they want a social experience, um, and these video games do that. You know, the kids are on the headphones talking to their friends, and they're, um, you know, there's they, they, they're playing the whole time. They start to stop when they want. And when they mess up, nobody screams at them. So it's an, an experience that is owned by kids and is designed by kids. And, and, and the company's doing a lot of business off of this idea. We don't do that much in youth sports. And, uh, and so that's a, a real challenge and a real opportunity. The second one is just reintroducing free play. We know over the past generation, uh, maybe even you know, going back to 1990 or so, there's been this real shift from you know just neighborhood uh, hop on your bike go play at the park down down the way type of play to to organized play we've always had organized play but when I was a kid I think I slipped on a uniform at age eight for the first time and even after that most of my sport uh, activity was in parks making up games with my friends that developed the love of a game that you know today propels me I play beach volleyball, I play soccer, I play tennis, pickleball, I surf, I live in California, that's what we do, uh, et cetera. And this all started with a lot of the free play 
um, when I was a kid. So how do we bring, how do we shift the balance back to more free play type of opportunities, which are also more affordable? Uh, the third is uh, encouraging sports sampling. So that means two things. One is pushing back against this trend toward early specialization in one sport where kids are asked to focus on soccer or baseball or whatever else it may be, basketball, uh, even football at a very early age um, to chase the scholarship, the mythical you know, scholarship which some kids get, but many kids do not and they often get there and in many sports it's not actually a full ride. Um, how do we shift that to an environment where multi-sport play is kind of the standard, at least through age 12? It's a time to specialize, but it's, it's not before puberty. The second thing encouraged sports sampling means is exposing kids to a wider variety of sports than ordinary, ordinarily they would be exposed to. So in most communities, it's the same set of sports, baseball, soccer, et cetera. Uh, they're team sports are often you know, hand-eye coordination sports, they're explosion sports. They often draw on the same set of skills, but there are probably 120 different sports out there, not every community, but there are a lot of sports. So how do we connect kids, whether through PE teachers being uh, innovative or parents uh, identifying uh, um, opportunities? In the, how do we connect them to sports like, uh, you know, lacrosse or rowing or fencing or, you know, uh, gymnastics, whatever else it may be, there, there's, um, there's a sport for every, even archery, you know, there, there's a sport for every kid out there. So how do we be a little bit smarter about the uh, matchmaking? The fourth is revitalizing in town leagues, which simply means, uh, you know, local, low cost play, classmates playing against classmates. Um, it's the little league model. Um, not the Little League World Series model necessarily, but the, the Little League uh, community-based model. Um, it's in town, you know, it's house leagues, things like this. That have been sort of, I don't know, you know, come to be seen as second class. Um, and that's really unfortunate. You know, the travel team environment is now pushed down to age, you know, six and seven years old. And we sort the weak from the strong in these very early ages. And what's unfortunate is we end up losing a lot of the kids who can't afford you know, who can't afford the, the $2,000, you know, check that uh, club play uh, costs at a very early age. So a real solve there is just to take, you know, the local fields and maybe prioritize uh, organizations that serve kids in mass, uh, and, you know, at scale and at low cost and, uh, and don't require a whole lot of transportation uh, to, uh, you know, to get them to these, uh, to these venues, which they enjoy. Maybe they can ride their bike there if they're lucky. Uh, the fifth one is um, thinking small, which really means nothing more than um, uh, using this, the, 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 the spaces in your community create, creatively uh, and collaboratively. So, you know, the park and rec spaces, you know, do they have shared use agreements with the schools where, where they can use each other's uh, facilities? Uh, during the off hours. Um, you'd be surprised at how often that doesn't happen. It's also a matter of like uh, developing, you know, unused spaces. So like little mini soccer pitches. You don't always have to have a big field or five big fields, one of these mega facilities. You can put like a, a, a space in, a, in like an urban neighborhood uh, that a lot of kids could use, um, you know, to play 3v3, 4v4, 5v5, uh, futsal or whatever else it may be. Um, again, with no coaches, much lower cost. So how do we how do we you know uh, foster that kind of environment? Uh, the sixth is design for development, which is nothing more than a plea to anchor our sports system in the pr principles of age appropriate or developmentally appropriate play. Right. So six is not sixteen. You can't. You shouldn't coach six year olds like you were coached in high school. Their brains are different, their bodies are different, their needs are different. Um, so, you know, this is how you progressively build better athletes too, is by understanding the stages that they, uh, that they work through and, uh, and adjusting your equipment, uh, your, the length of your season, the motivational techniques you use when you're working with kids, which ties into our seventh uh, strategy, which is train all coaches. 
So what that means is just giving coaches the key competencies of working with kids. So that would be, you know, that would be, you know, general coaching principles, safety things like CPR, first aid, abuse training, safe sport stuff. It means, uh, it means sports skills and tactics because kids, you know, they want to get better. They really do. They, 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 you know, they, uh, if, you, if they know how to, a first, you know, how to do a first touch in soccer uh, feels good, you know, and and makes you more likely that you're going to be motivated for the next moment and more likely that you're going to sign up with you know, the sport the next year. And the eighth is emphasize prevention, which is really a response originally was to the concussion crisis in this country. There are uh, a lot of unnecessary concussions happening, brain injuries happening with kids at an early age. And this is causing uh, parents uh, some parents to not even put their kids in sports they're worried that sports are not going to create a positive health outcome obviously texas football it's a big deal it's part of the culture um uh, never want to talk you out of uh, football in texas what i would encourage you to think about doing is think a little more intentionally about flag football for instance there's no research showing that kids need to be banging heads at five and six and seven and eight and even 10 or even 12 years old they can wait until high school you can get them physically you know uh, active and develop their physical literacy help them solve problems with their hands and their feet before they solve problems with their with their heads um, it, you know tom brady did not play tackle football until uh really until high school a lot of the best players in nfl history did not play until then so keep their bodies fresh keep them you know you know, the kid has two or three concussions before high school, they probably shouldn't be playing, they shouldn't be playing high school football at all. So, you know, do right by kids by, by emphasizing um, injury prevention and safety strategies. So these are all eight strategies that we rallied our whole network around. And I would encourage you to think about as well as you attack the, you know, the obesity equation, maybe some version of what I just presented. We also found it valuable in putting together a, a visual model of what uh, good looks like. So if sports in America is a, is a pyramid right now where, I don't know, 70, 80% of kids sign up at an early age, but then we create the travel teams and we start structurally sorting the weak from the strong well before they grow into their bodies and their minds and interests. How do we square the pyramid? Um, and how do we make physical literacy and love of game uh, the, the, the goal? at least up through age 12. I mean, the, the research suggests that if we do that, um, and you're more likely to produce positive outcomes uh, in terms of the development of elite athletes, you know, at the Olympic level or otherwise, or kids are gonna play in high school, uh, or even just kids who maybe just wanna play recreationally, but they do have the ability to snowboard or play on the company softball team when they're 22 or play golf or whatever, they just, their, their bodies have been in motion. So this is what good looks like, a visual representation, physical literacy at an early age. So what, again, we organized the knowledge, pushed it out there, got heads nodding. Step two for us was organizing the organizations, getting the, the, the folks around the table and saying, okay, well, you know, how are we going to uh, end communities and say, okay, how are you gonna adapt this elsewhere? Our report was released by, uh, in 2015 uh, with the support of uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, uh, who uh, was and is now again uh, for uh, US Surgeon General. Uh, and he uh, used our report to, as a call to action for communities to, to embrace it. Um, and that is what we have done since then. We've gone into 10 communities now. This is just, uh, this is just six of them here. Um, we have reports coming out in the next couple months in central Ohio and also Camden, New Jersey. Um, we've also done Hawaii and we've done Mobile, uh, you see Mobile, Alabama. And what we do is we take the, these eight plays in our frame where we go and we say, okay, all right, how are you doing in Southeast Michigan on training coaches and free play and, you know, use of your play spaces. We collect data. We do surveys in schools, ask kids, what are you playing? What do you want to play? Um, and we develop a lot of really interesting insights. You know, for instance, in Harlem, surveyed kids of you know 50% Latino community. What do you know? Hockey was one of those sports 
that uh, kids wanted to play. So terrific. The NHL and Madison Square Garden worked with us to bring uh, floor hockey into the schools in East Harlem. Uh, low cost access to some form of the game that's really useful. So these reports are very powerful, like 40 pages or so. Um, they have, you know, findings along the eight plays, and then there's a set of recommendations uh, that can help uh, communities mobilize to uh, get and keep more kids playing sports in their communities. So, you know, it's baseline information. If you don't have the, the basic data, you can't, it's hard to manage, it's hard to manage, but you can't measure. So this is a, these are resources that folks have found to be really valuable. Well, we haven't done any in Texas yet, but happy to talk to the folks if there's any interest. Well, uh, another thing we do uh, that we find really useful is just um, bringing our networks, our various networks together once a year through the, uh, through the Project Place Summit, which has become the premier gathering of uh, youth sports and health leaders uh, in the country. Uh, uh, we share tools, uh, new tools, uh, projects, uh, resources, and we release the annual National State of Play report, again, with data. What are the trend lines? What are we seeing? Where are the opportunities? Uh, where are the successes? How do we elevate those? Um, and we host uh, workshops and uh, featured conversations with uh, a lot of very important people. Michelle Obama was our keynote one year. Rob Manfred, the Major League Baseball Commissioner, Kobe Bryant, et cetera. We also then, um, in 2017, brought together a set of organizations uh, to say, um, okay, um, you know, y'all are the folks who can, who can move the chains. Uh, if you if we connect the silos here and we develop shared actions and mutually what we call mutually reinforcing actions and collective impact uh, 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 methodology and uh, and that's what they did we brought these folks around a roundtable and began to create new tools and uh, focus on uh, specific areas uh, uh, within the project play framework including training all coaches and sports sampling. One of the products of that was uh, US, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee working with Nike and asked them to create the How to Coach Kids website, aggregating free resources for uh, coaches anywhere and organizations anywhere to use to, to get their coaches trained in, in, in key competencies and, and working with kids. Uh, yeah, so check it out if you would, you would like. Again, no, no cost on any of this stuff. We also created a healthy sport index with a hospital for special surgery. Um, you know, the, the, we, we have the CDC sitting at our table, as well as American College of Sports uh, Medicine and HSS. So, because we believe the healthcare sector uh, plays a, needs to play a real role in uh, building healthy communities through sports. So, got together with HSS and said, what can we do? And so, well, let's create a tool for parents to help them figure out which sports might be best for their kids. If their kid's sedentary or if their kid is lonely, uh, you know, we can, we'll gather the data and we will aggregate it and weight it and let you know which sports are most likely to produce uh, phys higher physical activity rates or which ones produce the most psych the best psychosocial outcomes, uh, et cetera. So it's, uh, check it out. It's uh, healthysportindex.com. Again, free. Uh, you know, this is more from the Healthy Sport Index. You can kind of weight your, what matters to you. It's a really cool little tool and it spits out the different sports with you know descriptions on the sports and a lot of deep dive on the data so step three um once we got the organizations together and once we had developed the knowledge was mobilizing parents so you know they are the gatekeepers again they're the ones who decide originally which sports kids are going to be signed up for usually um so how do we empower them not look down on them not treat them like they just need to be educated or they just need to shut up on the sideline, although some of them do need to shut up on the sideline. But how do we give them tools, uh, such as the, you know, the, the, uh, the Healthy Sport Index, that are gonna allow them to make better decisions for their children uh, and, and really address the environment? So one of the things we did was we created a, 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 a last year or, or two, two years ago uh, called Don't Retire Kid Campaign. Uh, Kobe Bryant helped us um, launch it on ESPN. Um, it was a series of PSAs on TV, magazine, print, radio, um, and it drove to parent advice and resources offered up by 
athletes like Clayton Kershaw or Texas is Clayton Kershaw uh, and 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 uh, Kobe Kobe and Albert Pujols and uh, you know uh, female athletes and uh, it really resonated. There were you know billions of organic media um, uh, impressions that were generated from this campaign. Uh, you may remember it was a 13 year old going up to a uh, up to a press conference and uh, announcing his retirement from sports because the parents had just gone. It just it just wasn't it didn't feel like his experience anymore. It was very impactful and um, you know really helped uh, kind of wake the parents up. So the good news is if, you know if, by attacking this problem from a number of different angles, we have been able to generate some impact, right? So we know that you know, hundreds of organizations have taken actions guided by the playbook. They told us that through surveys, you know, leagues, ESPN, ESPN created the first access to sport prom uh, uh, to its corporate social uh, responsibility platform, became a leader in the space in that way, uh, grant making, so forth. Cities and counties began to shape their youth um, strategies and policies based upon the framework. Um, it's unlocked, you know, probably 55, $60 million minimum so far in foundation and corporate grant making. It has uh, caused community sport providers to revise their programs, and it helped shape the first ever national youth sports strategy, uh, which was put in place by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, a couple of years ago. Uh, more children now are uh, playing sports, or they were pre-pandemic, uh, based upon the based on the data we received at that time. And there were and the, the rates of physical inactivity uh, by one measure uh, from the Sports and Fitness Industry Association uh, uh, were going down, again, in the six to 12 category. Now, the physical activity itself uh, uh, by the federal government's um, survey of high school students has continued to go down since, um, since 2011. So we're now launching phase two of Project Play, which is reimagining school sports in America, which will hit that population uh, group uh, more directly. And we're going to develop, we're going to find the best schools in the country that uh, provide healthy sport uh, uh, activity to the broadest swath of the student population. It's not about winning state championships. It's about developing as many students as possible uh, through sports. An exciting, um, you know, uh, phase to our work, sponsored by Dix and Dix Sporting Goods and HSS and uh, Adidas. And we're getting out one hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars in awards to the best schools in the country. So please, if you know any schools in Texas that are doing a great job at getting lots of kids involved in sports, um, go to our website, apply. Uh, we'd love to take a look at your application. Um, but we're in real time here now where some of these gains uh, that have been made at the lower level um, um, are they're, they're presenting new challenges. I mean, COVID was uh, has been it's a it's a historic uh, disruption in, 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 in sports, uh, youth sports and school sports. Um, and we, what we've seen is this uh, environment of sport has and have nots getting wider. The kids uh, from homes with money um, who can afford club teams, a lot of them are back at playing, at least you know, training and practices. And even they're off playing tournaments and games. Say. It's controversial activity, you know, given the, the need to control COVID, um, but they're playing. Uh, meanwhile, we have kids from lower income homes who rely on uh, part and rec programming, YMCA's, boys and girls clubs. And it's been a lot tougher to restart those programs. So we really have our work uh, cut out for us uh, as we um, as we as we come out of this pandemic. We could end up um, seeing what happened in the last economic disruption in 2008 to 2012, where uh, kids from lower income homes just their their sport participation rates fell, and they didn't really recover. So um, now is the time to really dig in. If we don't do this, if we don't do this, then we are going to see uh, additional problems with um, obesity rates <clears throat> climbing. It's just going to happen, given the importance of physical activity. So with that, uh, thank you for uh, 
uh, uh, listening, and um, I think we left a little bit of time for uh, for questions. We did. Thank you very much, Tom. All right. Anyone who has questions for Tom can put messages in the chat box. Um, I will start off, start us off by asking a question, Tom. How feasible do you think the a transition of the culture around sports in youth is? Do you think this is something that can make some real strong progress in the right direction if communities like like those in Texas who are who are listening now um, embrace these kinds of ideas and run with them? Uh, yeah, I'm, well, first of all, my, my bias is I'm a glass half full person, right? I'm, 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 I'm an optimist. You, you can't do this work unless you're an optimist. I'm also realistic about the challenges that we have. So we have a culture uh, that has um, of youth sports that has been, um, someone say, professionalized over the past, you know, 20 years, 25 years. I don't think it's really, it's just been commercialized. Uh, there's a lot of money. Um, probably $30 billion flowing through youth sports in this country. A lot of it is through sports tourism, these travel team tournaments, parents staying in hotels, beds and heads and beds. Um, and a lot of that's fun. Look, I did it, my son played college soccer. I, I, I understand the benefits of all that. But I think we all need to commit to a model, at least to raise 12, in which sports are accessible to all. If you're creating it, if, 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 if stakeholders out there, sport providers, and those who surround them, supporters or otherwise, insist on, on, on you know, programs that are accessible to kids, making room for uh, kids from low income homes or even kids with, with disability at, you know, at, 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 or at certainly at early ages, although we should look for unified kind of opportunities throughout the, throughout the, the life cycle. The, um, then we're just going to build a better uh, sport by sport model, but it's really going to take it's going to take providers saying, "Look, I'm committed to access. Uh, I'm committed to uh, you know age appropriate play." And it's parents um, and policymakers, you know, uh, town recreation councils, otherwise, holding these organizations accountable, saying, "Okay, great, we're going to let you use our field space, but please tell us." How are you making this this activity available to all kids in our community and not just uh, the kids who can afford this? Um, it's going to take that level of commitment and rallying around the vision. If you do that, you're going to end up with a healthier Texas and you're going to end up with more vibrant communities. Uh, you know, kids are going to have exposure to more kids from diverse backgrounds, um, you know, and, and we'll end up, uh, frankly, we'll We'll, we'll end up with uh, just a, a better civic ethos, you know, because sports is an amazing place to get to know other people, to work through our biases. Uh, nothing like competing with other people, training with other people that, in terms of actually getting to know them. Um, so think of sports as a, you don't even have to be an activist. Think about it as like a, as a way to address racial bias or even gender bias uh, in our society. That, those are great points, Tom. Thank you. We have two questions in the chat box now. The first one actually asks about bias. What do you uh, do? You think that weight bias and stigma is a challenge in the inclusive sports culture? It is right. So there are a couple biases there. One is the, the kid who is overweight or obese. Um, it can be. Uh, more challenging for that child to play, to get invited to play, or feel like they belong on a highly competitive team that is very winning focused at an early age, right? Coaches just unfortunately have this idea that their job is to win that game on Saturday. No, their job is to develop a love of sport in children and help them learn about themselves. Uh, so they can be the most um, effective and competitive uh, members of our society. So if you have that win by Friday mentality, what you're going to end up doing is just you're going to hold the tryouts and you're going to pick the kids who are the biggest uh, or the fastest or the early, you know, bloomers or the early, the kids who've been trained up from an early age. And the kid who is overweight, it's, um, 
it's just it's just more challenging for them to find a place on those teams. So, you know, uh, again, you know, twelve and under. Let's let's like commit to a culture in which you know all kids have an opportunity to play, and that the job of a coach is to develop each individual kid up through age twelve. So they want to sign up the next year. So it's going to take a shift in in uh, in, in, in in how coaches think about their their. Uh, their roles. There also need to be more sports introduced to kids who are overweight that uh, that might be um, tailored to their to their body type. I mean, football is actually a good sport. Tackle football is a because you've got linemen and uh, uh, but but there are other sports where kids can be bigger as well. Maybe, you know, for, you know, weightlifting. Uh, there's uh, you know the, you know boxing. Well, you know. Uh, I've had injuries in boxing as well, but there are uh, there are other sports. You know, track and field has a number of you know shot play, discus, and things like this uh, to get kids involved. When you talk about kids, um, you know, not focused on winning that game on Friday, I I spent years coaching my daughter's volleyball team because the competitive nature of the other team she had access to just did not appeal to her, and I found there were two of us that coached when we stopped focusing on winning the game and started focusing on making sure the girls learned teamwork, how to work together, how to support each other and not criticize each other on the court. They started playing better and they won all their games. You know, they were champions at that club and yep. they had much more fun and they became better players. And we had girls of all shapes and sizes and all abilities and they, you know, working together made them better athletes and, and made them better people. The, the most important thing is they all went on to learn leadership skills and self-discipline and how to, be, how to be part of a team that really served them well in other aspects of life. And the, the parents would tell us this. They'd tell us that, you know, their, their moody teenage daughter who used to spend all the time in a room by herself was now engaging with the family and in much better spirits and able to deal with school much better. So I think we're missing an awful lot of what sports can bring to kids' lives if if we just focus on the winning. So thank you for making that point. Yeah, we no, have, you raise a really good point too about, you know, this parents have, they, they, they need to understand that the research shows that winning, winning actually falls very, very low on why kids play sports. They play sports, they, they like to compete. They might even cry at the end of a game, but they're they're done with it. Five minutes later, they're done with it. They don't want you know the, the ride home, the dinner table at night. That's when parents are obsessing about that. So, creating those environments where kids can test themselves and can compete, but we don't get hung up on the results is extremely important. So good for you for doing that. And I encourage all parents to think about that as well. Great, thanks. We have another important question that I think is probably in many listeners' minds right now. When is this coming to Texas? And I will add to that with what, what can communities do if they like the ideas you've been talking about and want to see those changes happen in their own communities? I mean, reach out to us. I mean, we work, you know, we, we pick uh, two communities a year where we go in and we landscape the state of play, right? Um, like I said, this year, in the next couple of months, you'll see reports coming out. I mean, check them out. That's what you should do. First, check out the reports that we're going to be releasing on Camden, New Jersey, and on Central Ohio. Um, you know, these 40-page reports where it's a lot of data, surveys from students, insights, findings. I mean, so, you know, coming to Texas, that, that's what that means. Is, is there, uh, you know, is there an organization, an entity that would want us to come in and help them understand their state of play and create the conditions to mobilize stakeholders from across the eight sectors that touch the lives of kids. A lot of great things can happen. I mean, it's just, you know, we went into the, you know, the, the Wilson regions, as we call them, uh, Southeast Michigan and Western New York. And, you know, we did our report and now we're out and they've got full task forces going and all sorts of activations and people are really mobilizing around the opportunities. And, tens of millions of grant making from foundations that have resulted from that. So a lot of great stuff can happen, but it starts with a, a basically a, a landscaping and analysis. Great. 
we have a couple comments in the chat box about children with disabilities and the experiences they have with sports, um, the social emotional needs as well as the physical needs. And tied into that comment is a que uh, another question about what resources are there to offer uh, for children with disabilities, resources that might be available to coaches, to parents, to communities. Do you have any of those on your website? Yeah, so I mean, kids with disabilities uh, often have very distinct needs based, to, based upon that particular disability, right? They're kids with intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. I mean, these are, you know, different sets of challenges and opportunities and barriers that, could, that are surmounting. And there are groups that have done a lot of really great work in that space, such as Special Olympics. Uh, with you know kids with intellectual disabilities they've got lots of resources we encourage you to go there um, you know kids with physical disabilities like blaze sports and there are others that have, have done some great work so we tried not to be duplicative uh, and instead we tried to be sort of that holistic agent that drives the conversation about how all of these entities in the space can work together um, so yeah, so I would, I mean, we do have some resources, or we, but they're kind of integrated within uh, our, our other uh, materials. If you go to our website, uh, projectplay.us, you'll see things broken down by resources by, for coaches, for leaders, and for parents, uh, including parent checklists, 10 questions you should ask your, you know, your child, yourself, and uh, your local sport provider. Um, so just yeah, rummage around and then and there's there's probably something in there for you. And reach out if you if you uh, need something more. Okay, wonderful. Well, we are right at the end of the hour, and we're we're going to move into our next set of presentations in about two minutes. So I'm just going to take a moment here to uh, thank you, Mr. Tom Ferry from Project Play at the Aspen Institute. Thank you so much for being our keynote speaker for the Live Smart Texas World Obesity Day Summit. And we appreciate you joining us here today. I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, practice what we're talking about here, get up and move around a little bit, stretch, um, whatever your favorite brief activity is, a few moments of deep breathing or, or meditation, if that's your thing. We're gonna come back in two minutes and start with our Live Smart Texas quick presentations from Live Smart Texas steering committee members throughout the state. I'll be starting off talking about the work that we're doing here in region 910 to address obesity, and we will be hearing from members from throughout the state. So take a brief moment. I'm gonna shut off my camera, but you'll hear me come back on in about a minute. Thank you so much, Mr. Ferry. Thank you, Dr. William.
Okay, welcome back to the Live Smart Texas World Obesity Day Summit. We are now shifting into part two of our um, four hour summit today. We're going to be hearing short presentations from uh, members of the Live Smart Texas steering committee from around the state. Uh, we have representatives from different health service regions across the state, as well as various organizations who, who all focus in some capacity on obesity, especially obesity in children. So as the slide says, Live Smart Texas is a statewide coalition of organizations and individuals working together to address the state's obesity epidemic. You can find us at www.livesmarttexas.org. And if you're a social media person, please feel free to tag us in any of your posts today. All right, we are gonna start off talking about Region 910. I am the co-chair of Live Smart Texas. Our regional representative for Region 910 is Ms. Pema Garcia from the Texas A&M Colonias Program. Uh, Pema is unable to be with us today, so I will be providing the, the presentation about the work happening here in this region. We're addressing obesity from many of the angles that I talked about at the beginning of the summit, including the clinical treatment and management of obesity. There are many partners working together in the region. We, we also refer to our region as the Paso del Norte region, which stretches a little bit beyond the health service region to include West Texas, Southern New Mexico, and the border region um, just across the border from El Paso, Texas, in Juarez in Mexico. Um, I'm located at the UT Health Science Center School of Public Health. I'm the director of the Center for Community Health Impact at the El Paso campus. And we've been working closely with many partners throughout the region to address the clinical treatment and management of obesity. We're tackling this from several different perspectives based on input we've received from healthcare providers in our region. Um, two of our primary partners right now are two federally qualified healthcare centers in the region, La Clinica de Familia and Centro San Vicente. With their input and feedback, we have identified target areas where they've told us they need support to better address obesity with their patients. These areas include more training for healthcare providers and staff, um, a treatment algorithm. So after developing a training program, the providers asked to have an easy to access treatment algorithm to help them remember what they learned in the intensive course that we developed. So we are integrating a treatment algorithm software program into the electronic health record system so that providers can quickly um, click through the steps required to adequately diagnose, treat, and manage obesity with their patients. They also asked for help supporting the customized dietary approach important to help people um, maintain compliance with a calorie restricted diet. We developed a mobile app so that it could be used quickly, conveniently from any location and at low cost. And so patients and providers can log into that app and track their progress together. And the patients actually select their own diet from a specialized menu that's customized to consider uh, cutting edge principles in nutrition science with regards to weight loss, and at the same time be made up of menu items customized for the region based on cultural preferences of those living in the region. We also have a customized integrated behavioral therapy approach that can be taught um, in group sessions within the clinic setting. And because of COVID, we're ensuring that all these tools can be accessed both online and in person. The partnership also includes collaborators at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Other work happening in our region to address obesity includes multiple interacting projects focused on healthy food and food systems. You can see here this food access impact pyramid, which is developed by the Food Trust, indicates how important it is that we address food access from multiple levels including access to healthy food in retail settings. Uh, to do that, we've partnered with the County of El Paso to pass a new policy and establish a new program called the El Paso County Healthy Food Financing Initiative. We've, we've also been working with a coalition of partners, many of whom um, you'll see on the next slide, to develop in-store marketing and in-store nutrition education 
and other support systems like WIC enrollment and SNAP enrollment. Um, we're working on pricing incentive strategies and then dietary counseling. And the dietary counseling comes in many different forms. We've got groups, for example, um, a, a group of food pantries in the region being led by Kelly Memorial Food Pantry uh, with support from our food bank, El Pasoans Fighting Hunger. And they've partnered with the YMCA and other food pantries in town. Uh, their program is called Fresh Start. It's based on a program that was originally developed by Dr. Katie Martin in Connecticut. And this program empowers people to address the root causes of hunger in their lives, rather than just focusing on providing food in an emergency setting kind of format. And so they work individually with participants in the program using motivational interviewing to support those participants to set goals and provide them connected resources throughout the community to help them reach those goals. And that includes nutrition, education, um, physical activity opportunities, volunteer opportunities, and assistance with whatever goals are most pressing in their lives. If that may be learning to speak English, applying for a job, finding housing, and so forth. Um, we've assessed food access and availability through a, a large assessment project several years ago, um, and then a convening of stakeholders that prioritized that the areas, these three areas that were of interest by stakeholders throughout the region. And you can see the mapping process we did at the top. That's the final map that overlaid multiple maps to look at access to healthy food, where the, where the most grocery store sales are, for example, uh, death due to diet related diseases, income level, any of the areas in the map that are colored red are areas of the county who, that have the highest need when it comes to all of those areas. So low grocery store sales, low income, high death due to diet related disease. And by prioritizing these three areas, now we can target programs and projects to especially um, ensure that we're helping the most vulnerable people that live in those red areas. This includes the Healthy Food Financing Initiative I mentioned earlier, the in-store coalition, and additional support to increase SNAP enrollment and use throughout the county. Here's our in-store programming coalition, a group of partners that work within local, locally owned grocery stores to facilitate nutrition education, which is led by the Texas A&M Colonias program through a program called Heart Smarts. These are short nutrition lessons that get delivered. You can see some of the nutrition lessons being delivered here in the top picture. Um, those lessons happen in two to three minutes with a sample, sample of a healthy snack. We also have folks from the SNAP and WIC department there to help, help with enrollment. Uh, the SNAP enrollment comes from our FQHC partner, Central San Vicente. And then we've got teams of partners from the University of Texas at El Paso and the UT Health Science Center doing health screenings right in the stores and providing referrals to local healthcare providers. Our city of El Paso runs a new Be Well program to help families create healthier habits to feel energized and be balanced. And we have a Healthy Schools Coalition working in partnership with Action for Healthy Kids, a national organization that's very active in Texas. And you will actually hear from uh, Action for Healthy Kids a little bit later in this session today. And this coalition is working to address nutrition and physical activity, as well as other aspects of health, mental health um, and stress in school districts throughout, throughout the um, Paso del Norte region. Much of the work I'm describing has been supported with grant funding from the Paso del Norte Health Foundation through their Healthy Eating Active Living initiative. I am now going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Belinda Reininger from Brownsville Health Service Region 11. She's going to tell you about the work they have going on in their region. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wiggum, for um, allowing me to present and represent a little bit of the work being done in Region 11. It is um, my pleasure to, to be here. You know, one of the things um, on the on the next slide, you're going to see that we've taken a, a long term view of of how to build health and address obesity in our region. And we're really seeing it as a, a culture change, a time where we build on the 
the um, context and the culture of our local area, the resources, the assets that we have to bring to this issue, this very complex issue, and as well, really embracing the fact that we need to change policy and environments. We need to change the systems, the way we link together. We have a collaborative action board that has been in existence for nearly 18 years um, that is basically a large network of organizations and individuals, um, some really deeply involved in health, but some really deeply involved in education or economics or the other um, very related topics to help. And so this collaborative action board has really driven the various change that we've seen. I'm just going to highlight two, uh, two pieces of this work. So I'm very much doing a disservice to um, everything that's happening, but I wanted to um, talk about two things. So on the next slide, you're going to see some of our partners. Um, and these are municipalities. Some of them are cities, some of them are little towns. And we have worked together uh, as, a, as a subset of this broader coalition to implement very tangible change, um, policy change, environmental changes, and system improvements in these different municipalities uh, through a program called Tuso Luzi Cuenta. And this program has really allowed a evidence-based model to be implemented in these regions that change, that have the potential to change the lives of people living in those, um, in those communities, particularly low-income, uninsured um, participants, their whole family. So we're talking about children uh, through uh, um, adults. So a little bit more about this program is on the next slide where we call the um, call out some of the components of the two salute sequenta program. Prior to COVID, we had about 220 free exercise classes across the, this, this region and in these municipalities. Um, the, the classes are taught by um, certified coaches, community health workers, um, and we tie in the, the various types of exercise you know, all, Zumba to yoga to Tai Chi to walking clubs, you, you know, you name it, we're trying to be um, really diversified in that. And then we tie in um, healthy eating messages, cooking classes, referrals to um, weight loss support groups. Uh, we, we promote very heavily and we're so proud to, to do so, the It's Time Texas Challenge, so that we have a number of, of um, municipalities and, and participants from this region. We have support groups. So the, the exercise classes create a, a fanning approach, a referral approach to even more services. Since COVID, uh, we, we did a very quick uh, transition. We still have nearly 200 classes going. They are virtual now and we provide a lot of support um, virtually. So we really didn't miss too much of a, a, of a beat on that one and we wanted to keep that going. In addition to the exercise classes and educational opportunities, uh, we're very, um, very involved, very committed to working with policymakers and, and uh, leaders of these communities in implementing environmental changes because all of you know, right? It, it takes all aspects of this to, to create change. So community gardens and farmers markets and changes to uh, sidewalks and walking um, paths, et cetera, um, began many years ago and continue to this day. So we do focus very much on low income uninsured populations to enroll into this program. And when we identify individuals with uh, an elevated BMI, an, a high blood pressure. Uh, we enroll them and our community health workers who are based in each one of these cities uh, follow up with individuals, provide additional motivational interviewing, additional education, additional referrals to um, achieve weight loss, to achieve control of, of um, health conditions. And so, in, in that, we meet a lot of people, a lot of success stories are happening. And so we're able to tie that in through our Two Salute Sequenza programming, uh, those success stories into media. 
uh, media attention, social media, mass media, uh, to let others know and to let others see the possibilities of making changes. So more about the Tusalud Sequenza program is always available. Glad to talk with you about that. But as a way to close out my few minutes with you today, I wanted to highlight on the next slide the Karakara Trails experience um, and network that Cameron County, uh, the region is building. And this came from the partnership, this, this, this uh, collaborative action board, these cities working closely together, had a vision, had a vision that it wouldn't just be little areas, little pockets that would have better hike and bike trails um, and access for their communities to um, be active, but instead it would be a regional plan where people could have transportation opportunities, where we could build tourism, um, active tourism opportunities. Um, and this plan is now in the phase where we are starting implementation. We have segments, catalyst segments of this plan that are being um, you know, in the ground, being put in the ground. Uh, I will tell you that there are some segments of this 290 mi plus mile trail um, system that are going to go through national park areas that have never been able to be accessed by um, by the population. And so doing it in an eco-friendly way, uh, there are paddling trails um, through areas of our, of our beautiful region that will be highlighted. It's, it's truly gonna be a, a treasure in the sense that it will bring in tourism dollars to our area. So of course, I'm inviting all of you to come experience the Kara Kara Trails. But in addition, it's gonna be a treasure to the people who live here because we know that when you have better access to hike and bike trails, to places to be active, that you are more likely to do that. And in fact, we found in, in local research, local studies that people who live in Brownsville closer to trails were tw uh, exercised 22% more than those who did not. And that translates into dollars saved, um, by avoiding healthcare conditions. So we're really, really excited about this. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reininger. Next, we're gonna move on to Health Service Region 8 with Denise and Antonio. Denise, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what our city of San Antonio Metro Health um, uh, facility and, and agency is doing to create um, more policies and events um, and community initiatives that uh, really work to um, promote more of the nutrition, physical activity, and uh, mental health uh, services that we're offering to our community. Next slide. We are actually going to talk a little bit about uh, the nutrition policy update that we have been working on um, called Healthy Procurement and Healthy Vending for Businesses. I'm gonna highlight a couple of physical activity events that we're uh, currently planning with uh, our co-partner, um, which is uh, the YMCA and other uh, city entities called Ciclovia. A store initiative, our Puerto Vida restaurant program, and our Metro Health COVID-19 vaccine mobile outreach efforts. So to start, next slide. To start with the nutrition policy, we're working on a healthy procurement vending policy that um, has been approved and uh, implemented across all city um, departments where we have uh, healthy food and beverage requirements. Um, to uh, purchase any kind of food or beverage with city dollars on city property that must adhere to our healthy food guidelines. Um, this particular um, policy was really important because it um, was actually an administrative directive that came out from our um, city uh, departments that have uh, encouraged the staff to um, really go and, and look, look for more um, ways to create healthy options and choices for meetings that they're having and also any kind of um, 
uh, summits or conferences that they're actually planning as well. Um, this will become more important as we return to work and go more to our offices and um, we'll be um, expanding the initiative and actually helping and training our staff to learn how to make those choices. Um, and that's through a tool that we created and that we're actually doing trainings on. Next slide. And that particular um, tool is a checklist that helps us to know that their vending, their, their packaged products, um, their prepared foods and beverages all meet uh, food service guidelines. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's a checklist that the staff actually can go through and know that they're following the guidelines. So this is a helpful tool that we're currently now training all staff across the city departments to learn how to make these choices. Next slide. The two events that we're currently um, developing and, and uh, coordinating are called Cyclovia. Cyclovia used to uh, occur at a much larger scale in the previous years, pre-COVID. And that usually drew about 65 to 70,000 participants. These were bike riders, walkers who would come twice a year, usually in the spring and in the fall. It is a partnership between the YMC Parks and Rec, our, our metro city planning, SA environs, and a number of other space organizations to provide space for physical activity. Um, this year, due to COVID, we have actually through how we would make this much more concerted and much more um, targeted to the areas that most are in most need. And that would be um, two particular regions that we're working with um, will be on the east side and on the south side. And that's really important because we have um, most of our health disparities are um, highest in these areas. So we feel that working with the local um, community-based organizations in those areas, along with the Y, will be most um, beneficial for the families, not only to create that time to um, have some physical activity and resources available to them, but to also to create um, much more sustainable programming and physical activity opportunities for those uh, residents in those areas. Next slide. In addition to that, we're working on a healthy corner store initiative where we have eight stores uh, working um, in District 3 that started in FY20. We've been very happy to garner the support of City Council to expand this initiative, to add 12 more stores to three more districts during this current um, fiscal year. Now we're at 20 uh, corner stores where um, we know that we're offering residents in the most underserved areas of the city fresh produce at an affordable price. This is a really great program that um, our city council, our residents, and our staff are so excited to be working together on, not only to provide the fresh produce, but to also coordinate our services and to provide more comprehensive programming. So we're including and integrating nutrition education from our current um, programs, our diabetes education, where they can sign up at the time that they come to the groceries, to the corner store. And also we're trying to coordinate some flu and COVID vaccine registration events at these corner store locations as well, because we know that those areas are in most need for those um, particular vaccines. Next slide. So we know that um, part of our other reach is with another program called Por Vida. And that's a restaurant recognition program that helps um, restaurants make healthier items available on their menu. And we have been working currently with seven, I'm sorry, with 14 restaurants and seven business partners. And we'd like to expand the effort to include smaller restaurants in underserved communities where we know we have the most significant health disparities. And we'd like to create um, options for those particular um, Restaurants with, um, we know that a lot of people are actually able to access, but we know that they don't have the most healthy options. So as you can see that here we highlight which options they can um, choose that would be a healthier item. Um, and we hope to have much more uh, communication with our smaller restaurants in our most underserved areas. Next slide. So we're hoping that in addition to what we're doing, 
with our, our corner store, we're also looking to expand our effort with uh, COVID-19 vaccine mobile outreach to not only encourage um, people uh, on how to, or the, the importance of getting the COVID vaccine, but also how to create and how to live a healthier lifestyle. So we have a community health worker model where we have been going to the most underserved areas with the highest number of COVID cases and deaths, um, going door to door to educate people, not only on COVID, but where to get testing and also to make their vaccine appointments at the time that we're working, that we're actually with them. Um, in addition to that, because our, corner, our community health workers are um, working toward uh, childhood obesity strategies, they have also been integrating a healthy eating component into that outreach. So we're really excited about how our Healthy Neighborhoods program has been working currently in the, in the most underserved, high disparities neighborhoods in our region. If you have any questions about any of our programs, we'd be happy to share some of what we're doing and uh, any of the materials that you might need from us. You can contact me, Denise, or any of our community uh, and Healthy Neighborhoods program coordinators. And we look forward to um, hearing from you. And if you'd like to uh, collaborate, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Oki Park uh, from Lubbock, Texas Health Service Region 1. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oki Park. I'm a uh, research assistant, assistant professor from the College of Human Sciences at Texas State University. I'm here today as a proxy of Naima Mostet Mosta, who is a representative of Health Service Region 1. Uh, and also, we are the part of Obesity Research Institute from the Texas State University system. Uh, today, and I'm going to share about obesity prevention efforts from our health service region. Next slide. Since we are from higher educations, our obesity prevention efforts uh, has foc have focused on community outreach and engagement, and also multidisciplinary obesity research with community partners in the West Texas Panhandle areas. First one I want to introduce is community-based family nutrition program we called Let's Cook, Eat and Talk. This is funded program from U.S. Department of Education as a part of East Lubbock Promise Neighborhood Grant Program since year 2013. The objective of this program is to improve healthy eating patterns and strong family relationship in underserved areas in the West Texas Panhandle areas. And we, through this program, we built a lots of collaborations and partnerships with nonprofit organizations in West Texas to make this program successful to achieve healthy eating and family relationship for underserved uh, uh, family members in, neighbor, in our neighborhood but also make the program sustainable in, the, uh, in that area so that way community build their pride and bring some uh, community ownership in this neighborhood. As a, 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 a findings of this program were they really uh, motivated family members in underserved neighborhood areas to bring some attention for healthy eating and uh, close family activities and reduce um, stress uh, inside the home. So that's another, and also increased health concerns in these areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, the second community outreach and engagement program is school nutrition innovation and education from our regions. One example is sustainable life skills to reduce obesity program we call the Cerisro. This one uh, is like established and then by a multidisciplinary uh, obesity prevention expert from designers, um, uh, nutritionists, and uh, child development expertise and uh, dietitians. And we developed a innovative school nutrition uh, uh, curriculums and implemented in Title I schools in West Texas. So our goal of this program is to increase healthy eating 
and it build healthy classroom activity, uh, active health, uh, classroom environments, and uh, build healthy positive body image and self confidence among uh, you know uh, all the other adolescents in school system. The next next slide. Uh, some of our uh, you may know about the OLE Texas. This is the outdoor learning environment uh, program from our university. It provides, but it's a statewide program. It promotes local activities such as OLE design workshops, also provides technical assistance to child care centers. If some child care centers want to implement some design, uh, designing and facility in child care centers, they can contact us and they uh, uh, receive some consultation from our team. And it provides statewide wide training for design professionals. And the goal of this program is to increase uh, physical activity and food awareness and also enhance education in outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So I, I introduced about uh, some uh, few examples of our community outreach and engagement program from our uh, you know, university. But also I want to introduce about Interdisciplinary Obesity Research Institute. It, uh, it uh, was established in year 2013 and founding director is Naima Mosted Mosa from uh, Nutritional Sciences from Texas State University. And we have associate director uh, Janet Dufour, she's a, a faculty from cell biology and biochemistry from Texas Tech Health Science Center. Next slide. Uh, uh, OBC Research Institute has three, uh, uh, you know, fields. So, uh, uh, such as basic sciences, clinical sciences, community and population fields to promote obesity research, community outreach, and engagement under multidisciplinary collaborations. And in our ORIs, um, we have lots of uh, faculty steps, community people who are working for obesity prevention areas. And they, we also have some many external collaborators in, uh, in domestically and at international uh, higher education some school districts and nonprofit organizations in West Panhandle, Texas. Our goal is, is to promote obesity research and our community outreach and engagement. And uh, we have a virtual ORI annual meeting uh, this year, Wednesday, May 12th. So, and the topic is education, environment, and health disparities and opportunities as a Hispanic serving institutions. So we will send out uh, more information later on. So this is about uh, uh, some health service um, reason one obesity risk, uh, prevention efforts. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Oki Park. We're gonna move on now to health service region four five, Tyler, Texas with Paula Butler. Um, I understand we might be having a few technical difficulties. Um, as far as I can tell, the slides are showing now, but we will continue to try and ensure that we don't have any further glitches. Uh, Paula, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you now. Great, good morning, everybody. Um, if you go to the first slide, please, the next slide. Thank you, I'm Paula Butler. I'm the Regional Program Leader with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and I serve um, the East Region for the Live Smart Texas um, program. Next slide. So if you're not familiar with um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, we are part of the Texas A&M University system, and we are an education agency seeking to improve agriculture and food production, um, advancing health practices, protecting the environment, strengthening our communities and youth. We have a presence in every county in the state. You can see here the East Region serves 44 counties in East Texas. Next slide. Within our Family and Community Health Program, our goal is to foster health and wellness through educational program delivery, 
um, to reduce the risk of chronic disease and the management of targeted chronic diseases. And we, our objectives are listed there, which is increasing physical activity, fruit and vegetable consumption, maintaining a healthy weight, increasing water consumption, and decreasing sugar uh, sweetened beverage consumption. We also promote health, well being, and safety among children, youth, and adults, and foster workforce development through food safety education and early childhood education programs. Next slide. And we do that through our signature programs. And so this is a, just a slide of a few of our signature programs um, that we offer. Next slide. So what I wanted to do is just give you some strategies that we use in our counties um, and give you five quick examples of um, programming that has happened where we target audiences and we work with community partners and we engage volunteers to deliver and implement programs across the state, but specifically in East Texas. Next slide. So Dinner Tonight is one of our programs. Um, it's a signature program. We have a website, dinnertonight.tamu.edu, and it was developed to provide quick, healthy, cost-effective recipes. It tastes great. Um, we do a lot of things on social media. We have weekly video demonstrations. All of our, uh, a lot of our recipes will have the videos to correlate with them. And we offer cooking tips and techniques, nutrition information, menu planning basics, and we are all built around the USDA dietary guidelines. A couple of years ago, um, we partnered with the American Heart Association and 70 plus of our recipes are heart tech certified. Next slide. So in our counties, our county extension agents also um, deliver programming and deliver dinner tonight through healthy cooking schools. And this is just an um, example that I wanted to share of one that recently happened. Um, of course, in 2020, we switched a lot of our programs to virtual. This was a virtual dinner tonight healthy cooking school. These face to face events are generally two hours. This is one that happened a couple of weeks ago during SNOVID. And um, we had five agents, five urban counties that put this together, we utilized volunteers in the form of Medical City Healthcare Dietetic Interns and BWL Solutions Dietetic Interns. And they created a plan for the week. There was two hours and 24 minutes of live and recorded video demonstrations. And they did this through a closed Facebook group. Um, you can see there, there were 217 active members with the post comments and reactions in the group. And we targeted the counties that the agents were from, but we found that we had um, audience members from nine different states. We do use post, post survey on this particular event to assess knowledge gained and intention to adopt healthy food preparation practices. And we're aggregating that information right now. Next slide. So this is just an example of it. another example of how we use volunteers are, we have a suite of diabetes education programs that we offer. And this particular one is Do Well, Be Well with Diabetes, which is our signature self-management program. This was delivered last year virtually by a team, uh, a three county team of agents. Um, one of our agents is a registered dietitian, but what they did was they engaged um, healthcare professionals um, to help deliver the programs. And so it was very successful. Um, and just a, a little bit different approach that we used for delivering this program. Next slide. Um, Families Commit to Be a Fit was another um, virtual event that happened. And this was a group of, I think there were three or four agents, county extension agents that worked on this through um, a closed Facebook group. And it really was intended to get people walking through Walk Across Texas, our physical activity eight week program. So they created a closed Facebook group. They had 250 members join the group. They had them enroll in Walk Across Texas and they um, included health and wellness education through daily posts and interactions. And this it was very successful. They're getting ready to kick it off again in the Anderson County, um, that uh, area of East Texas. Next slide. Healthy School Recognized Campus is one of our signature programs, and we are delivering in eight rural counties in East Texas um, this program through a cohort called Wellness 2022. And there are 22 schools involved, and our goal is to reach 4,000 youth and 800 adults. And it is a school based intervention to improve health behaviors with students, teachers, and families. And it uses the curricula bundle that's incorporated with Healthy School Recognized Campus. Next slide. <clears throat> so some of our, this is very hard to see, but some of our programs or what the premise of is, is that the school is to implement a walk across Texas um, school wide program. And then they commit to, along with our commit, uh, county extension agent support, they commit to um, another youth program, another adult program. 
Oftentimes what they're implementing is our Learn, Grow, and Go 10-week gardening nutrition physical activity program. It's an evidence-based program. They have a suite of other things to, um, that they can offer as well. And then our adult programs include some of our cooking well programs, cooking well with diabetes, um, cooking well for healthy blood pressure, some of our dinner tonight, our, our um, SNAP education program, Fresh Start to Healthier You. And um, what we found here is these are just some examples of the numbers of um, things that are happening right now in those counties. Um, one thing that's really been important or valuable for our youth is our 4-H Explore curricula. Um, we have food and nutrition, several different curricula that are utilized, and we've done a host, a bunch of um, online cooking um, adventures for our kids. Over the last year, they've been very successful through Zoom. We get them in their kitchens at home, in their Zoom kitchens. We've had 50 to 75 kitchens online at one time, and our county extension agents are leading them through a cooking experience. Um, it's been really, really fun. We've also engaged culinary arts um, students at high schools to um, do campus-wide um, dinner tonight programs, along with some of these um, virtual cooking schools for kids. Next slide. And then the final example I wanted to share, and this was really just um, looking at how we partner with groups. Um, this is Texas Retired Teachers Association in District 10. Last year, they reached out to us and they wanted to walk with our Walk Across Texas program. And so um, the lead commissioner engaged 278 folks to register. They had 264 that were active. The average age of these participants was 68, and they walked 45,999 miles, which was an average of 174 miles per participant. It was very um, effective during COVID-19 for sure, and um, they are getting ready to kick off again with another um, Walk Across Texas event. So if you go to the next slide, um, our big um, focus and strategy is to target audiences, work with agencies and partners, and we really engage volunteers in doing what we do. We always want to connect with you and um, others in our communities, and so reach out to us at agrilifepeople.tamu.edu and um, that will lead you to our um, directory where you can find our county extension agents and other personnel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great job. All right. We are going to transition on now to one of our organizational updates from Texas AgriLife Extension. Um, Mike Lopez is going to introduce Dr. Stephen Green. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much and howdy. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Lopez. I'm an Extension Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Uh, my main programmatic role is to support the statewide implementation of three team-based physical activity programs delivered online. Uh, and currently I serve on the steering committee for Live Smart Texas as the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension representative. Today, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Stephen Green, the Assistant Agency Director for Family and Community Health so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Green to highlight our agency statewide health-related and chronic disease prevention efforts. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to, to join you today to briefly update you on Texas A&M AgriLife Extension's health and wellness initiatives, particularly those focused on obesity prevention at the state level. As Mike mentioned, I'm the Assistant Director uh, for AgriLife Extension's Family and Community Health Unit which is an academic unit, unit consisting of over 50, 50 faculty, staff, and student assistants. You've already heard from uh, Paula Butler, our regional program leader in the East region, and later you'll even hear from Alice Kirk, who, who actually works in our FCH unit along with Mike. But our unit provides subject matter support for our network of county extension agents, which I'll talk about more in just a, just a minute. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you who are unaware of who we are and what we do, and Paula did a good job of, of quickly going over that, but I want to take just a minute to provide a, a quick overview of who we are and really what we do. We are a unique education agency that is part of the Texas A&M University system. And some of you have probably heard of land-grant institutions, and we are the land-grant institution in the state of Texas. We also have Prairie View A&M, who we work closely with, but the, the mission of a land-grant institution, it has a three-part mission, teaching, research, and extension. And perhaps the best way to describe um, what we do in AgriLife Extension is that we are the outreach arm of the Texas A&M University system. So we take the research that's done 
not only at Texas A&M, but across the US. And we translate that into educational programs that actually have an impact on individuals and families and, and communities. We are headquartered in College Station. However, we do have a statewide network of professional educators, uh, trained volunteers, and also uh, county offices. As Paula mentioned, we have a, a physical presence in uh, 250 of Texas's 254 counties, but we do serve um, all 254 counties uh, throughout the state. And as you can see on the, the slide, our, our vision and mission are really encapsulated in, in that statement. And that is we help Texans better their lives through high quality, relevant continuing education that encourages lasting and effective change. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to share this, this quote from me. It's from Dr. Everett Rogers, and it, he made it in 1963. So that's over 55 years old at this time, or that quote. But it captures really the essence, I think, of what we do in extension. And it's since the inception, the main purpose of Cooperative Extension Service has been to change human behavior by teaching people how to apply the results of scientific research. Um, our educational programs, they are based on the latest research and best practice recommendations in obesity prevention. Next slide. Our agency is divided really into three primary content areas, um, ag and natural resources or agricultural and natural resources, 4-H youth development, and family and community health. And increasingly, we work at the intersection of ag and youth and, and health and because agriculture plays a, a, a major role in our, in our food production systems and, and nutrition related matters. But really our mission on the FCH side is to help Texans better their lives through science-based educational programs, which are designed to improve the overall health and wellness of individuals, families, and communities. Next slide, please. Our approach to obesity prevention, it's based on a socio-ecological model, but that also takes an account, into account a lifespan perspective. So our emphasis is on um, prevention education. We do target uh, multiple audiences all the way from pre-K uh, children. We work a lot in early childhood settings, both like Head Start and um, other uh, uh, childcare uh, centers, but also more informal family day home providers. But then we go all the way up to the schools. We work with schools and after school programs um, uh, to adults in churches and work sites. And, and we work with older adults in senior living facilities as well. So as I said, our partnerships go, or our programs um, reach a, a, a broad uh, spectrum of, of audiences. Our programs, as I mentioned earlier, they focus on two key areas. Uh, physical activity and, and nutrition. And our goals, of course, are to help individuals meet physical activity guidelines and to adopt healthy diets. And we strive to do that through, um, through people, uh, programs, and partnerships. So could we go to the next slide, please? With relation to people, our network, I would say, is our greatest strength as an agency on the um, family and community health side, and you can see the list of, of individuals or, or groups here within our uh, family and community health program and some of our internal partners. But we have a team of county extension agents who are supported by highly trained uh, health specialists with PhDs or, and master's degrees in health and nutrition. Our six regional program leaders, and Paul is one of those, um, coordinate programming in the various regions of the state. Uh, we also work with our other internal partners and volunteers. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our Healthy Texas Institute and that initiative, or our Master Wellness um, volunteers through our Master Wellness Volunteer Program, or as we collaborate with our 4-H Youth Program, our Healthy Texas Youth Ambassadors. Um, next, please. So in addition to people, we have our programs. And, and once again, Paula touched on those. Uh, Alice is gonna, uh, Kirk is gonna speak as well uh, related to partnerships. But 
our educational programs are, they are research-based. Uh, we strive to, to only implement um, evidence-based programs where we can, but also programs based on best practices in health and nutrition. And where we do have gaps in, in our programming and we see needs in Texas communities, we work to develop, implement, and evaluate programs to establish that they are indeed evidence-based and that they do have an impact on children's and adults' um, health status. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our programs are intended for a very broad audience from those early childhood years all the way up to older adults. And if you think about it, I mean, we all know this, we live in a state that has roughly 30 million people. And our view is we're gonna have to engage in an all hands on deck kind of approach if we're gonna tackle um, obesity in the state and even at the national level. But given that we have a population of roughly 30 million, um, we believe that technology is going to be an essential aspect to, to extending our reach and being able to reach a, a growing share of, the, of Texas's growing population. And so many of our programs do have a, a technology uh, component. And you see some of them listed here. Uh, Paula talked a little bit about Walk Across Texas. Um, that is our one of our walking programs, uh, Walk Through Texas History, which taps into our unique um, history as Texans. Uh, Balancing Food and Play is, a, is another one of our programs. It's school-based. Um, it deals with both um, physical activity and nutrition, reducing sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, Dinner Tonight, more on the nutrition side with healthy recipes. Um, some of you are familiar and have collaborated on Learn, um, Grow, Eat, Go. Um, of course, we have our Better Living for Texans or our Food um, Stamp and Nutrition Program or e, uh, FNEP, which is our Expanded Food and Nutrition Program. Um, and the list just goes on and on. So we have a lot of programs that target both nutrition and, and physical activity. Uh, I mentioned technology. Uh, go back just one second, please. Um, we do have, a, as I mentioned, we are emphasizing technology more and more, um, and we utilize web-based apps, and Walk Across Texas, for example, um, has, has that component, which allows participants to track mileage um, and so forth, steps. We also have a relationship, and this is somewhat new, with a company called Pi Health, or Personal Activity Intelligence, and that enables, uh, participants a more objective measure rather than self-report data um, but to uh, do more of an objective measure of cardiorespiratory fitness and so um, we're always developing new programs and uh, trying to work with partners to to get those disseminated across the state uh, let's go to the to the last slide uh, which is a which deals with our partnerships um, our efforts, um, as you can imagine, they are highly dependent on key partnerships with other agencies and organizations and other entities at the local, regional, state, and even national levels. And we do recognize the value of those partnerships. And in fact, many of my colleagues who are presenting today uh, work with you and partner with you um, on this challenge of, of obesity. And as I mentioned, we believe it does require an all hands on deck approach and so um, our funding uh, of course funding and external funding plays a large part of in this as well to support our programs and many of our programs and initiatives are supported by state and national funding partners such as CDC, USDA, uh, HHS and at the state level Department of State Health Services so um, if you have questions and Paula mentioned this uh, about what we do and how you can partner with us or have any questions about our programs, we'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have and you can contact us using the link that, that Paula provided earlier. But thank you so thank much. You, Dr. Green. We're gonna move on now to Texas AgriLife, I'm sorry, to uh, Action for Healthy Kids and um, Alice Kirk and Michelle Smith. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to round out today's uh, Live Smart reports. And today I'm going to share about how Texas Action for Healthy Kids is advocating for the health of our kids across the state. Talk, as we are often referred to, 
provides grants to Texas schools and supports the building of local collaborations and partnerships to support school health initiatives. Next slide, please. My name is Alice Kirk, and I am with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and I do serve as one of the child health specialists for Extension. I am honored to also serve as the chair for Texas Action for Healthy Kids, working alongside Michelle Smith, our Texas State Coordinator for Action for Healthy Kids. And you're going to hear from Michelle a little bit later. Next slide, please. First, a little bit about who we are. Action for Healthy Kids has been engaged in work with schools around nutrition and physical activity since 2002, when Dr. David Satcher, in his role as Surgeon General, declared that we had an obesity epidemic. Teams from across the U.S. gathered in Washington to strategize on how we could have an impact through schools on our children's health. Since that time, we've expanded our vision to not only focus on nutrition and physical activity, but to encompass the whole child model with a goal of having children active, healthy, and ready to learn. Next slide, please. In Texas, we have a robust and active steering committee. Monthly, our steering committee meets with representatives from a variety of foundations, organizations, and agencies that help to shape our initiatives and support collaborations across uh, the entire state. We really work together to avoid duplication of efforts and just ensure that we're all pulling in the same direction to impact children's health. Next slide, please. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, talk like so many groups, continued charging forward to support school health initiatives where we could. We awarded 45 nutrition and physical activity grants and eight emergency equipment grants for school nutrition departments many of which were supporting their efforts to provide drive-through meals during the virtual and hybrid school programming. We also gained more engagement with over 4,000 members. We had greater attendance at uh, numerous virtual learning sessions which we provided, including several trainings focused on the School Health Advisory Councils or SHACs, and our annual talk summit, which focused predominantly on exploring more community and school partnerships to improve children's health. Next slide, please. So why focus our work with schools? As our keynote speaker, Tom Ferry, with Project Play noted, whether in a face-to-face -face setting or with virtual classrooms, with after-school groups or youth clubs, schools can help serve as an important partner in shaping healthful behaviors that children can adopt for a lifetime. We are all role models for our children, and as you can see here on this slide, their health and their academics are impacted when we work together to improve nutrition and physical activity opportunities. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Michelle, who will highlight some of the school efforts that we have been engaged with in the past year. Thanks, Alice. <clears throat> Action for Healthy Kids uh, understands the important role that parents play in keeping our kids healthy. So. Part of our focus is on getting parents engaged in school wellness at the district and at the campus level. Over the past few years, as uh, Leah mentioned, we've been implementing a project in El Paso that helps connect parents and schools to the community um, around school health. And we have a district wellness coordinator who is working with five districts in the El Paso area right now. 
uh, connecting parents through the school health advisory committees and engaging the community through our Healthy Schools Coalition that we developed. This project has allowed school districts to connect with each other, helped members of the community engage with districts, and shown parents how they can make a difference. This year, uh, across the state, we're adding something new. We're adding uh, family connectors, and we will have one in Irving, working with Irving ISD, and one in El Paso. And they're going to be focusing on connecting families and schools at the campus level around wellness activities. Next slide. I'd like to share a little bit of information about two of our success stories. The first one is Whitaker Elementary in El Paso. Uh, they started out with a small grant from us to build some school gardens, which they leveraged into uh, getting some additional support from community organizations. So they not only built the gardens, but they added a greenhouse, they put in outdoor classrooms, um, they grew enough food that they were able to share surplus with the local food pantry. And now they have turned their attention to social emotional well-being of their students and they're remodeling a building on campus to be a place for kids to just be themselves and a place where teachers can take kids um, as a reward or if they just need uh, a place to have a few minutes. So the, this school is very definitely concerned about obesity issues as well as other health issues and they realize that we have to focus on the whole child to be able to truly have an impact on the problem. Next slide. Another strong initiative uh, was the one we funded this year for 20 elementary schools in Irving ISD. We've partnered with the Catch Global Foundation and these schools are focusing on nutrition education for their students. The physical education teachers are the ones that are providing this curriculum for the most part and it's been really challenging for them with students attending in person and virtually um, but they've partnered with other school staff um, to make sure that the lessons are active and enjoyable and the kids have really responded and totally enjoyed and and been able to grasp the concepts of things like the slow go whoa approach to uh, child nutrition next slide this is really quick, so if you'd like to know more about what Action Healthy Kids is doing, you can visit our website. We have information um, for on COVID, on reopening, uh, webinars and learning opportunities, uh, including ones that are happening in Texas, tip sheets, and um, as they become available, we will have our grant information up there. Next slide. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've been excited to be part of LipSmart and participate with all these great organizations in all these different regions. Now more than ever, we really have to focus on keeping our kids healthy. As you've heard today, kids are not as active at home as they were when they're attending school. And we need to make sure that when they do go back to school, they have those opportunities to be active and that they have nutritious food and that parents are part of this process. So feel free to reach out to myself or Alice if you have questions or if you need additional information. Wonderful, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we are running just a little bit past our scheduled time. So rather than entertain a live Q&A through the chat box, I'm gonna ask that if you have any questions for our panelists, please go ahead and put them into the chat box. The panelists have access to that chat box and they will be able to respond directly to your question. So any questions you have, please feel free to ask those now. Also, as a reminder, this, this entire webinar will be available after uh, we complete today. Um, it'll take probably at least a few hours, but you'll get a notification once the webinar is posted online. And you will have the ability to go back and revisit any slides if you want contact information or content from any of those slides. All right, we are gonna move on to the next portion of our event today. We will be hearing from the Partnership for Healthy Texas. Um, Live Smart Texas is a member of the Partnership for Healthy Texas. In addition to being co-chair co for Live Smart Texas, I also serve on the steering committee for the Partnership for Healthy Texas. The partnership began in 2006 and has grown to a coalition of more than 50 organizations. We serve to improve the public health as a valued partner in the fight against obesity and continue to have a concerted influence on Texas policy. We believe that by working together, we can maximize our impact on the health of Texans and drive economic productivity by reducing the burden of chronic disease. The mission of the Partnership for Healthy Texas is to develop and promote state policies that prevent and reduce obesity in Texas. 
Today, we're going to be hearing from uh, Jamie Wesolowski, who will share a few words about the involvement of the Methodist Healthcare Ministries in the obesity prevention battle. Then we'll be moving on to uh, hear from Dr. Lakey, the, the partnership chair, and he will address the public health issues and policies from a statewide perspective and what needs to happen in communities across Texas to start to bend the curve in the right direction toward a healthier population for all ages. Next, we will hear from state representative, Dr. Alma Allen, and she will talk about her efforts to pass legislation relating to ways schools can help in the fight against obesity. And finally, Principal Garza will be talking about how her school prioritized healthy children and ended up improving much more than just the health of her children. So I'm going to turn it over now to Jamie Wesolowski. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Dr. Wiggum. Uh, my name is Jamie Oslowski, and I'm president and CEO of the Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Live Smart Texas for organizing this day uh, and to the Partnership for a Healthy Texas for inviting me to give some remarks on an issue that's front and center to so much of what we do here at Methodist Healthcare Ministries. You know, Methodist Healthcare Ministries has been uh, blessed to serve South Texas for 25 years. We're a private, faith-based, not-for-profit organization dedicated to creating access to healthcare for the uninsured through direct services, community partnerships, and strategic grant making in 74 counties across South Texas. Like all of you, uh, we know that obesity is a complex and challenging disease that affects so many people in communities across the country. According to the 2018 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, more than 40% of adults in the United States suffer from obesity. From 1995 to 2010, the prevalence of obesity in Texas adults doubled from about 16% to 31.7%. With a current obesity rate of 34%, Texas is now tied with North Carolina as having the 19th highest adult obesity rate in the United States. Obesity also impacts people of color much more disproportionately than the population as a whole. It's also more prevalent for those with less than a high school degree and making less than $15,000 a year. You can see it's hitting hardest in communities with higher poverty rates and lack of a strong public infrastructure, such as schools with safe playgrounds, well-lit parks, paved roads, and safe sidewalks. Rural areas are also challenged with attracting grocery stores that can guarantee a steady supply of fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy options. Also gone is the school requirement uh, of a one-hour physical education every day, something many of us remember as our favorite subject in school, right? Recess. So we at Methodist Healthcare Ministries are trying to address obesity from a number of different angles. The first is through the direct services we provide at our clinics and through our regional programs. We operate two clinics in San Antonio, the Wesley Health and Wellness Center, which serves San Antonio's South Side, and the Dixon Health and Wellness Center, which serves the city's Southeast community. Our clinics offer medical, dental, and behavioral health care through an integrated care model that facilitates an easy interaction for patients between those departments. For example, we, we know that some of our patients with diabetes may, have also have, may also have trouble with their teeth and emotional health. So through the integrated health model, our practitioners facilitate a smooth handoff between departments. So there's a continuum of care that is coordinated and responsive to the needs of our patients and clients. Additionally, these facilities are, are designed to be welcoming, a welcoming home for the surrounding communities with amenities such as well-lit walking tracks, an on-site pharmacy, uh, free recreation and enrichment programming that includes dance and sports leagues for adults and children. The convenience of providing medical care and physical activity in one place, minimizing the need for additional travel. In fact, the physicians within our clinics will often refer patients to our exercise programs, along with visits to our registered dietitians and if needed, consults uh, you know, with our certified diabetes educators. When you're treating someone who is overweight, the amount of medical problems can add up and seem daunting. 
So making things comfortable, efficient, and welcoming is one more way to ensure they are seeking the care they need. Apart from our clinics, we operate regional wellness programs through our Get Fit, Parenting, and Recreation and Enrichment teams. These programs help patients take care of needs beyond the traditional healthcare setting. The Get Fit uh, program is a preventive program aimed at averting type 2 diabetes, obesity, and sedentary lifestyles for school-aged children and their families. The program is offered through the, uh, throughout the academic year at various school districts and also in the summer as a youth summer camp. I was able to visit one of our sites in Santa Rosa, Texas, in a year before the pandemic hit, uh, where we saw firsthand just how engaged and interactive these programs are and how they drive home the lessons learned, lessons about an active and healthy uh, lifestyles, but also the importance of growing and sustaining healthy food in their own communities. We also have 88 faith-based community nurses which we call Wesley nurses, stationed in 74 counties across South Texas. Our Wesley nurses are registered nurses whose practice is not limited to the physical dimension of medical needs. Rather, it includes mind, body, and spirit holistic approach. Each one ministers to his or her community differently, but a common thread in their service is providing diet and exercise program, programming. Uh, health education, and coordinating access to food resources, such as food banks and food pantries, ensuring that, that their patients have access to healthy foods that can be hard to find. Through the strategic grant making, uh, our, our strategic grant making, uh, our organization provides uh, funding uh, that is committed to increasing access to care for the least served in the communities across South Texas. A number of these organizations are dedicated to combating the issues of obesity, childhood obesity, and food insecurity, and they manage a number of programs designed to address those issues. For example, during the past 12 months that our state, uh, that our Texas communities have battled the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've provided $2, $2 million to seven food banks in our service area, including the San Antonio, South Texas, Central Texas, Coastal Bend, and RGB food banks. Each of these organizations is focused on fighting hunger and food insecurity in, our, in the communities we serve, and we're just very proud to support them. Their efforts are especially significant in challenging times such as the past year and during the recent winter storms, because a food bank is a place people can always count on to provide in, in times of need. You know, we also fund a number of incredible and innovative partners such as Proyecto Juan Diego in the Rio Grande Valley, which addresses uh, obesity and diabetes through nutrition, uh, counseling, uh, diabetes management, uh, education, and the importance of exercise. In Del Rio, we work with uh, United Medical Centers and Corpus Christi, we partner with Texas A&M Coastal Bend Health Education Center uh, both of these programs uh, utilize an integrated healthcare approach to address and treat diabetes and obesity through screening, disease management, and health education. Those are just a, a handful of the dozens of partners we work with on programs designed to reduce the impact of obesity and chronic conditions like diabetes that dramatically affect our communities. Lastly, but maybe most significantly, our policy and advocacy teams uh, team works with public uh, advance to advance public health policies at the local, state, and federal level that can greatly support efforts to curb incidents of obesity in our communities. They work together with amazing partners such as the Partnership for a Healthy Texas, who join our efforts here today to support policies that can lead to improved health outcomes and increase the number of programs and resources available for all Texas families. Our policy and advocacy work also includes funding research, such as the State of Obesity in Texas Report, which can gather necessary data that informs and helps our elected officials craft good public policies. Our organization's voice is heard in legislative hearings and represented on important state committees addressing childhood obesity, such as the state's SNAP Incentive Study, uh, study Work Group. As you can see, 
this is a joint effort. It's, a, it's an all hands on deck moment that is required to, uh, in order to address the impact of uh, obesity has on our family, friends, and neighbors across Texas. The, the data and the research tell us this is an issue that is impacting all of us in one way or another. But I'm grateful that, that advocates and experts like all of you are taking part in discussions like, like we're about to hear uh, dur during the summit and, and will lead to efforts to make long-term and meaningful changes in our state for the people who rely on us for their care. I'm very grateful to all of you who are committed for your commitment, your hard work uh, to make change in our state. And I wish you all a fantastic and fruitful summit. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are gonna now move on and hear from Dr. Lakey. Welcome, Dr. Lakey. Dr. Lakey is the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs and Chief Medical Officer with the University of Texas System. Thanks, Leah. And first, thank you to everyone that's here today. Uh, this is a really important issue, and I know a lot of you could be doing other things right now. You're pulled in many different ways, but thanks for carving out time to talk about what we're doing in the state of Texas to confront one of the major public health challenges we have in the state. Uh, Jamie, uh, thank you uh, for kicking this off, but also for your support of the Partnership for the Healthy Texas. I also want to thank Clayton Travis, who uh, in many ways does a lot of the um, organizational work for the partnership, uh, as does Leah and others, and, and Michelle Smith, who uh, started the Partnership for a Healthy Texas uh, many years ago. With that, I think it's important to recognize that this last year has been a, a very tough year uh, for our communities, for our families, for our healthcare system, for older Texans, and for communities of color across the state of Texas. As part of this response, many of us have worked from home. Many of our kids have um, gone through their educational process at, at home. These efforts, although necessary, will have unintended consequences on the health of Texans. I think it's important to recognize it's gonna have challenges uh, and consequences related to the mental health challenges we have in the state, substance abuse challenges we have in the state, and the overall fitness uh, and well-being well of our, our residents. Today, we will focus on one area that many of us are really concerned about and have been working on for a long time, and that's obesity. And so again, appreciate you spending time with us today to talk about what we can do here in the state of Texas. One of the lessons I learned when I was the commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services is that you have to always balance the urgent and the important. And it's easy to get distracted when you're addressing an urgent issue, uh, such as Ebola or H1N1 or now COVID, and get distracted about those important issues for the state of Texas, whether it's improving the systems of care, addressing disparities, or addressing drivers of poor health, such as obesity. And so we must, in the midst of this response, not leave these other issues behind. COVID has intersected with the challenge of obesity in multiple ways. Individuals, adults, and children that are obese have been disproportionately impacted by, by COVID. They're more likely to end up in the hospital, more likely to end up in intensive care units. Uh, and it's just one of the health consequences of obesity. But we should also not be surprised at the end of this year that with a year uh, without structured exercise and activity, with the increased screen time that all of our kids have had, and in many times the less availability of nutritious food, that that will result in even worse uh, data related to obesity here in the state of Texas. Jamie just went through some of that data, but let me remind us kind of where we are related to obesity in the state of Texas. If you go back to 1985 and look at adults, uh, there were no states that had more than 15% of their population that would be categorized as obese. Um, by year 2000, no state had a higher rate than 25% of their population. Today, 34% of adult Texans are obese. 
And as Jamie noted, that ranks us 19th highest in the United States compared to our state peers. If we look at our kids, in the 1970s, only 5.5% of young people in the United States would be categorized as obese. Uh, nationwide, the now, now the number is 19.3%. So approximately one in five of our children in the United States would be categorized as obese. And obviously that has a disproportionate impact on uh, communities of color, the Hispanic population and, and black children in our state. So why is this occurring? I have learned that obesity is a very complex disease. I'm an infectious disease physician and I like when I can cure a disease with an antibiotic or an antiviral medicine and cure the disease. Uh, obesity is more complex. Uh, it is due to an inability of the body to regulate caloric intake and expenditure such that excess fat accumulates leading to obviously negative health consequences. And, and we should remember that obesity has significant adverse health consequences. The diabetes, the hypertension, the cardiovascular disease, including stroke, cancer, again, obesity now is one of the leading preventable causes of cancer, and the overall body aches and pains associated with obesity. While there's several types of factors that are caused, that cause the obesity challenges we have, we have internal factors such as genetics, uh, the physiology, the neurological components of it. Uh, these are hard to modify, um, but they do have a significant role. And science is uh, teaching us more and more about the roles of certain genes, the leptin gene, the combination of genes that can result in obesity. And hopefully with those discoveries, we'll get smarter for those type of defects uh, to be able to address them. But we also have to be fully aware that there's external factors that make it much easier to be obese or much harder to live a healthy lifestyle. There's those lifestyle patterns, there's the environment in which we live, uh, those can be modified. So while those internal factors may not be modifiable without the help of pharmacological or surgical interventions, the lifestyle or the environmental factors that influence fat storage can be potentially modifiable. As a result, access to and support of healthy lifestyle behaviors, such as nutritious food, active lifestyles, stress management, and sufficient sleep are important to address in our fight against obesity and our promotion of health. I'm also a strong believer in social determinants of health, that where we live, the environment in we live can really play a huge um, component in whether we can live healthy uh, in that environment. And one of the, the key components of that is our access to healthy food. In 2019, 35 million people, that comes out to about 10 and a half percent of the US were food insecure. And that's defined as access at all times to enough food for an active and healthy life. Since the onset of the pandemic, food insecurity has more than doubled, affecting as many as 23% of households and about 28% of Texans in 2020 were food insecure. But there are other contributors to this. Uh, there are school policies. You know, whether our kids can uh, have a meaningful recess, be able to de-stress during that time period, uh, the other policies that surround a school, the National Association of Sports and Physical Educators recommends a minimum of 20 minutes of recess each day for our children. But unfortunately, too many of our children in Texas don't have that opportunity for recess. I, I'm also a supporter of quality physical education. I am a parent of three kids, and I've seen my kids be in PE classes that were not helpful and be in PE classes where it was extremely structured by a well-trained educator and saw the value that my kids got out of that quality physical education. The policies that a school puts in related to its food is very important. Children's consume up to 50% of their daily calories at school. The quality of school meals has a significant impact on the child's health. And again, the community in which the child is growing, the community infrastructure, such as availability of healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate food, a safe places for physical activity can affect the child's health and in Texas, economic and ethnic disparities, again, really are 
they really do exist and need to be addressed. I think it's important to remind ourselves of what's at stake if we do not reverse these trends that we have all been discussing today. One of those is obviously an increased burden of chronic disease. According to a 2018 study, obesity, obesity accounts for 18%. 18% of deaths among Americans aged 40 to 85. That means that obesity is comparable to cigarette smoking as a public health hazard. And smoking kills about one in five Texans and is the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And so obesity is right there with smoking as a preventable cause of death in our state. But sometimes we need to also think about the other consequences of obesity in our state. And one of those is the economic impact that obesity will wrench out of our state. First, there's the healthcare costs. A 2016 study found that an annual medical spending in the United States attributed to obesity now exceeds 149 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars. In 2009, the comptroller from the state of Texas, Susan Combs, uh, put together a, a really profound study uh, called Gaining Cost, Losing Time, the Obesity Crisis in Texas. And at that time, the Comptroller's Office for the state of Texas estimated that the cost to Texas businesses was $32 billion annually by 2030, if the current trends of obesity continued. It's also having a profound impact on the military readiness of the United States and Texas obviously has been a, a long-term supporter of our military, but with the obesity crisis, it is gonna have a significant impact on the readiness of the United States. The Army estimates that 27% of the nation's young adults, those are individuals between the ages of 17 and 24, exceed the weight requirements to qualify for military service. And every year, about 1,200 enlistees are involuntarily discharged from duty because they cannot stay within the weight limits required by the Army. It is also having, obviously, a profound impact on other aspects of our children's health. The chronic diseases that they will incur, children who are overweight and have obesity as a preschooler are five times as likely as healthy weight children to be overweight or have obesity as an adult and have the diabetes, sleep apnea, cardiovascular disease, and other consequences that we've already talked about. Additionally, childhood obesity results in higher healthcare costs. And a child with obesity has $12,900 more of medical costs than a child with healthy weight. But we should also remember that if you're obese as a child, that many times you're stigmatized, uh, stigmatized that obesity has been described as one of the most stigmatizing and least socially acceptable conditions in childhood, and its impact on kids' mental health is significant. And then finally, academic performance. A research study concluded that children who are affected by overweight and obesity were four times more likely to report having problems at school than their healthy weight peers, and more likely to miss school more frequently. And so there's the current costs, there's the economic costs, there's the military costs, and the long-term impacts to our children's health, their overall well-being, mental health, health status, and their academic performance because of the increased obesity that we have in the state. So if we could, I'm going to go through a couple of slides here, but focus on what the Partnership for a Healthy Texas is going to be trying to do this legislative session. If we could go to the next slide. A reminder that the Partnership for a Healthy Texas is a broad coalition of advocacy entities, academic entities working together to try to address obesity in the state of Texas. And I'm not gonna read all these names, but they're obviously major players in health in the state of Texas. If we can go to the next slide. Much of the data that I've described is in this report, the state of obesity in Texas uh, that was uh, that Emmy put together working with many entities across the state of Texas. And this again 
uh, appreciate the funding from Methodist Healthcare Ministries to help put that together. And so if you wanna look at the, the data, I haven't used slides, but the data is all in this report. We can go to the next slide. At the beginning of the report, one of the things that we do is lay out what the priorities of the partnership, understanding the, this data and understanding what the laws and policies are in the state of Texas, uh, working together, trying to figure out what are some of those uh, important opportunities to improve the health of our kids. And I'm gonna go through these eight priorities in a second, but also want to let you know that for each of these priorities, the Partnership for a Healthy Texas has put together an informational flyer that has the data behind that, that recommendation. Why it's important, the data, and the specific recommendations that the partnership has to move that policy area forward. So let me go to the next slide and just break up those eight priorities into the next three slides. And so that the, the, the first body of work, so to speak, is to ensure all children in Texas have access to well-rounded education that includes recess, includes physical education, and instruction in health. That the first priority is to require that the school districts create and institute recess policies that reflect best practices, uh, considers those recommendations that our school health advisory committees that are really important uh, put together to allow our children the opportunity to be active, uh, to practice those life skills of interaction with individuals, and to um, be ready to go back into the classroom and learn. Uh, you know, kids that have been just sitting in the classroom for hours on end aren't ready to learn. They need to burn off some energy uh, and get those other social skills together. We believe that's an important uh, policy recommendation for the state of Texas. The second one is somewhat similar. Besides recess, uh, physical education, and I would say quality physical education, as I noted earlier, really is important. And so the recommendation for the partnership is to increase the middle school physical education requirement to include moderate to vigorous activity for six semesters, uh, high school PE requirements to three semesters, and to have one semester of basic health education uh, which obviously we have found this last year to be incredibly important as we protect our own health uh, in our environment. If we can go to the next slide, the second body of work is to address this food insecurity that we have in the state of Texas that's been exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic to increase uh, the Texans' accessibility to healthy foods and to decrease their risk for obesity. Yeah, as we noted, the access to, to food is, is really important. You know, one of those strategic opportunities is to fully fund the surplus agricultural products grant, which ensures food banks have the produce to keep Texans from going hungry during a pandemic. There has been a 200% increase in people seeking food assistance from Texas food banks since the onset of COVID. And the Texas Department of Agriculture had to put together what some of their um, budget reductions would look like and proposed a almost $2 million cut in the surplus agricultural products grant for fiscal year 2021. And that would drastically reduce the purchasing power of the food banks. According to research from the Texas economist, uh, Dr. Perryman, every dollar invested in this program results in $3.27 to the state including $1.65 of savings of reduced health care costs. So again, we think it's important for that, that program to be fully, um, fully funded and engaged in the state. The second recommendation in this area is to encourage Medicaid managed care organizations to implement initiatives to address these social determinants of health, including health, healthy food access. There are more than 4 million Texans who receive health care through the Medicaid program, almost all of whom are enrolled in managed care organizations, which are responsible for coordinating an individual's care while keeping overall costs low and meeting key health outcome metrics. Uh, these MCOs are given latitude to innovate with their local communities to provide value added services not typically thought of as direct medical services to address the enrollees needs. And for the past several years, the Texas's MCOs 
and primary care medical homes have given more attention to these social determinants of health. We believe this is an area that the state could encourage in, in order to uh, continue addressing uh, these really important social drivers of health, social determinants of health to address food insecurity. The last component of this um, overall framework is to increase access to SNAP benefits to our senior citizens by streamlining the application process. Texas has the fifth highest rate for senior food insecurity in the nation with almost 11% of our Texas seniors at risk for hunger. Not only does Texas have one of the highest rates of food insecurity among seniors, the state has low rates of senior enrollment in this SNAP benefit. Because of barriers in the application process, only about half of the almost half million income eligible Texan seniors are currently enrolled in SNAP. Then if we can go to the, the next slide. We also think it's important to protect and maintain and strengthen the current public health programs, educational infrastructure that is that is really important for obesity. Again, three specific um, strategies. One is to promote the uh, efficacy of the Texas Whole Children's Schools Health Policy Approach, our SHACs, and physical fitness assessments, which play a critical role for youth fitness and physical education. Those assessments uh, are of value to the parents, to the child, and uh, maybe the only way that a parent can have an accurate reflection of the health of their, their kids and their physical activity. Second part of this is to protect and enhance the current requirements for PE and health education. As I noted earlier, one of the priorities is to expand that. We also want to make sure that the current status is protected and we don't take a step backward. And then finally, uh, as somebody who works for the Department of State Health Services, I know how critical the funding that DSHS has for chronic disease is. Many times that's very vulnerable funding in the midst of a urgent issue like we're in right now. And so want to make sure that during the session, we do what we need to do to protect those funding, those funding streams for the Department of State Health Services to combat chronic disease and obesity in the state of Texas. So if we go to the last slide, again, I just want to thank you for being here today. It, it really is a pleasure to be here and appreciate all the great work that you do to continue. The, the fight against obesity and improve the health of Texans, uh, all Texans across the state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakey. All right, next we're gonna hear from State Representative Dr. Alma Allen to share her supportive policy that impacts children's health, including her sponsorship of recess policy last session that was passed but not signed into law by the governor and um, we are pleased to have Dr. Alma Allen with us today. I'll turn it over to you now, Representative. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for making me a part of this wonderful day. I've been on for the last hour and I have learned so much myself. So this is very, very important, um, the uh, state of health for Texans uh, in the state of Texas. First, I'd like to uh, read a proclamation in your honor for those who are working so hard to make obesity, ob obesity a thing of the past. Uh, so I'd like to share with you, I will not read the whole entire thing, but I will do want you to know that you are appreciated and that you are honored and your work is recognized uh, in the state of Texas, it does not go unnoticed. I've been looking a long time at obesity and healthy lives matter. And for a long, things have really come around for you. Things have, and for us, things have really changed. Complete streets, I'm noticing that was in every city I go into. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing that the extension services are working with the communities, not only communities, but working with schools and planting gardens and building kitchens in schools. And so that's very important. So kudos to you. And so let me uh, share with you this proclamation from the state of Texas. Whereas obesity uh, is a serious public health concern in the United States, and whereas more than 42% of, of all adults qualify as obese, including me, 
and the number of people with serious obesity continues to grow in the state of Texas. The adult obesity rate is 34%, as you've heard before. And whereas improving the treatment of obesity uh, requires concerted effort and action on, the, on, the, uh, on a number of levels, and observance of Obesity Week, Care, Care Week, which it takes place from February the 28th through March the 6th, serves to highlight the urgency of this health problem issues and the need to implement patient-centered uh, research drivers models of care. Now, therefore, February 28th, 20 through March the 6th, be recognized as Obesity Care Week in the state of Texas and that all re residents of the state of Long Star State be encouraged to learn more about the lifestyle that can lead to a to better health. Let me say congratulations to everybody uh, and, and let you know that the work you do is vitally important. I have also filed for the second time, and I must say for the second time, I want to uh, encourage people who bring legislation to the legislature that it is not always an easy thing to do. Uh, that sometimes you have to file over and you file over and over again. I've had some bills that I've been carrying for four sessions. This will be my second. The bill is 1594. That's the number. And I want all of you to remember it because I want all of you to advocate for it. The 1594 directs the Department of State Health Services to create a model recess policy that encourages uh, uh, age appropriate outdoor playtime and includes guidelines for outdoor play equipment. Now, I want you to know that this bill went through the House. That's very difficult, 150 get enough votes to come out of the House. And it went through the Senate and it went through the gut to the governor's desk where it was written out. The rationale for that uh, was that we had guidelines for play equipment, which they said. Uh, encourages or requires rather uh, schools and entities to have play equipment. So we're going to look at that really good this time and see if we can get this bill through. Last session, we had a number of kids who were brought to the Capitol and uh, to learn the process for getting a bill through. I hope that you continue that. This year is very going to be very, very difficult. Not many people are coming, not many people are, are, are being let into the Capitol building, but I hope you have plans for the next uh, academic year, the next session when it comes up, uh, that uh, you uh, bring your kids up to the Capitol to learn about the process so that what you are doing now as adults, they will carry on when they are, are exercise, when they are adult, uh, adults. Exercise and uh, proper eating is, is very important. As all of you know, I hope you know that at some point I was a, a teacher for 14 years. I was a principal for 16 years. And during that time, we learned a lot about the impact of health of uh, the children when they get good exercise. Not only exercise for, for obesity, but for their social and emotional well being. Most of us who are adults now remember uh, our friends from childhood when we uh, played on the playground, when we played together, when we were on teams together, we were on rallies together, when we did things together, that's where we formulated friendship and encouraged each other to go on. And we remember those through high school. Very seldom do you remember people from, the, uh, from your college years, but your high school years, you remember, they stay in your, in your mind and your heart forever because that's when you formed your, 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 the friends. I have high school friends, and for me, high school has been a long time ago. 1956, I graduated from high school, but I still have some high school friends that, that we still socialize together today. Another point is when I, when I was working on my doctorate, the one thing that I did was to get up and from my desk, writing a dissertation, and go to the park and walk two or three miles and then come back and sit down. 
it is so important that you have recess and exercise and time to uh, let your brains air out for, uh, for, uh, so that you can do better academically. Academics are so important. So it's all related. Uh, how well Texas does uh, academically in our schools, how well we do uh, in our uh, social and emotional skills is all contained in, in that exercise. And so I want to say to you, uh, thank you for those who work in the field, who generate uh, good things for people on the outside, who work with the parks and the gardens, the extension services, and I still work with those. Recently in my backyard, I had the extension service presented a, 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 a flower. Well, it was fl about flowers that time, but they also do plants over at the Civic Center. And so uh, that is important. So I want to thank you again for making me a part of your, your day. And I have learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Allen. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. And thanks for all your work uh, with, with these important bills. You're next, I'm gonna, next, I'm going to turn it over to Principal Garza to share um, about the work that her school has been um, conducting to make child health and culture the culture and, fo and how focusing on healthy children helps your school be successful academically. Uh, Principal Garza, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I am Patricia Garza, and I am the proud principal of Ortiz Elementary School in Brownsville, Texas. Um, I am thrilled to be a part of this World Obesity Summit event and advocating for the health of children and promoting physical activity. So thank you again for letting me be a part of this important and exciting endeavor. Um, a little bit, a little information about Ortiz Elementary. We service about 630 students, pre-K three through fifth grade. Our at-risk population is at 72%, and our economically disadvantaged uh, population is at 95%. We service 98 special education students and 144 limited English proficient students. Uh, we do sit in an economically disadvantaged area, so it is very difficult for our community and our parents to get engaged, well, it had been actually, uh, to be engaged with our school. Uh, we are a border town with Matamoros, Tamaulipas, so it we had a high mobility rate. So we had a lot of kids that on the weekends, they would go to Matamoros, sometimes they would go for three or four weeks and withdraw their kids and then they would come back. So hence the academic gaps. Um, however, I am very proud to say that Ortiz Elementary is a high performance, high progress school. And according to the Texas Education Agency Accountability Rating, we are an A-rated school with a 96 average academically. We are a five-time consecutive Texas Honor Roll School, and we are a two-time Texas Conference School. So how do we get this population of kids, this very difficult population of kids, and how do we get them to have this achievement? And really and truly, it's a no excuses attitude that we have enveloped here at Ortiz. Uh, we decided that we were gonna promote the whole child as we have listened to all these presentations. My staff is amazing and they work very hard in trying to meet the needs of these kids. We are experts at differentiated instruction because we have to, we know where our kids are coming from and we have to uh, get these kids in different areas. Um, one of the things we see is we also see a very high obesity and high diabetes rate with our children. And that comes from probably one of three things. One, the low income. It's a lot easier to buy food that is not so healthy. Two, a lot of times it's just a lack of education. The, the parents don't know the habits that are being formed in these children when they don't introduce them to healthy foods and physical activity. And three, we are an Hispanic culture and we love Hispanic and Mexican food and we love our tamales and our tortillas de harina, but we need to know that that needs to be eaten in moderation. Um, our teachers do small group, they do tutorials, they do accommodations, but we still weren't meeting, uh, reaching the, the kids the way I wanted to. 
So that's where we slowly started to envelop this idea that when the kids entered the building, they were going to have their minds and their bodies working. So we had the morning program. So the minute the kids open the doors, they don't go to the cafeteria and sit. They don't sit in the hallway waiting for their teachers to come. They go to the back and they join a running club or a fitness club or a marathon miles club. And they go and they run and they're provided incentives for completing laps. And we take them to running events on the weekend, such as the turkey trot. Or they can choose to go to the gym and we have circuit training available for them. And we have jump ropes and basketballs and music and all kinds of things for them to do. So then they shake off the cobwebs and they're ready to learn. So at 8.05, when their teachers get there to their classrooms and they're ready, they're engaged and they're focused. And they are, you know, they're in a different mentality than if they're just slumped sitting in a hallway. We decided to take it a step further. And we introduced intramural sports because a lot of elementaries don't have sports. They don't, they don't see that until they go to middle school. So we can now say that we have flag football, we have volleyball, we have girls and boys basketball, and we have girls and boys soccer. And the kids love it. They love to go out. They love to be with their teammates. And I'll tell you what, when I have a teacher come over and tell me that there's a kid that's not engaged, I walk over there and tell them, well, I guess if you're not engaged, you're going to have to stay and with your teacher after school and you're going to miss flag football and that attitude just changes because that kid wants to go outside after school we also realized that we were going to have to start educating the children about healthy eating um, and so we got i i went and i spoke with our cafeteria managers and i told them you know what my goal was so we took the kids on cafeteria tours and they talked to them about eating vegetables and fruits and and how eating too much sugar was not a good thing and how they would have sugar crashes if they ate too much sugar and we now have salads as a viable option for our students and we see more and more kids reaching for the salad versus the square cafeteria pizza and I go around the cafeteria during my lunch duty, and I see the would see the kid the kids that were opening their lunch box that had fruit or nuts, and I would commend them, and I would say, "Wow, that's awesome that you're drinking water versus something else." And all kids love to be praised, and all kids love to be praised by their principal. So the kids around them started seeing that, and they would bring healthy food, and they would call me over, "Come see what I'm eating. Come see what I'm eating." because they wanted that praise and, and they compare as to who's eating healthier now because we've just developed that culture. Um, I knew that I also had to get the parents involved because they're the decision makers for the children. So we kick off with a cancer awareness event in October and we bring in nutritionists and we bring in nurses to come and talk to the parents about how developing healthy eating habits and developing physical activity is going to help them to prevent diseases such as cancer and obesity and how it's so important to pass that on to their children. Uh, we also decided to have extracurricular events, so uh, activities. So instead of the kids going home after school and reaching for that refrigerator, they join cheer, they join dance, and they join Blue Crew, which is a spirit organization. And they're active and they're excited. And we take them to parades and we take them to performances. And um, they're just, they have something else to do. Um, I'm very proud to say that amidst this, the challenges of the pandemic, we have continued with the physical activity that we we set out. Um, we didn't want it. We didn't want it to end because we saw the good it brought to our campus, and we weren't going to just let it go. So we are continuing, and we are making. We know that that is the niche that is missing. Down below, you can see our flag football team. And if you look really closely, we even have one of our girls on our football team, and we promoted that and we highlighted that. And we just made her feel really special knowing that she could do whatever she set her mind to. And we have our soccer team in motion and our basketball team. So really proud about that. Um, the next slide. So in that attitude that I was talking about, no excuses, whatever it takes. And that's how we make sure that kids succeed. We stop at nothing. I know that we have to think outside the box when we have these kids um, that, that come from, from, air, from backgrounds of so many hurdles and so many challenges. And for me as a leader, I feel 
that promoting a child's self-esteem is one of the most important things I can do. If a child has high self-esteem, they're going to meet the expectations you put for them. And we have a very high bar uh, that the kids have to meet. But if they know that they're awesome and they have that mentality because we instill it in them, then they're going to meet that bar. I would go to soccer games and I would have children who weren't so great academically and they would sit slumped in a chair and because they never got their respect and the kids all knew that they weren't the brightest kid in the class. And so that kid didn't want to participate. He didn't want to be there. He was embarrassed. So I went to a soccer game and that particular kid scored two goals. So I made sure that I went into the classroom and I said, oh my gosh, guys, you're never going to believe. I went to the soccer game and Luis scored two goals. It was amazing. And that kid just sat up and he gained the respect of his peers and he now wanted to be engaged. And guess what? That turned into him doing so well academically. And it was just that trigger, that switch that we needed to that little slumped kid to now this kid who is ready and, and willing to work hard. The other thing that we saw was we started to see a lot of our kids being diagnosed with ADHD. And some parents wanted to medicate their kids and some not, and we respected both sides. But I knew in education, we had to do something um, for those kids who the parents said, no, I don't wanna medicate my child and we were like okay but we're going to do something about it and i read how exercise really really helps because these kids just have all this extra energy and we needed to find a way to to channel that energy so they go outside and they run and they they jump and they get part of that circuit training so then they come in and instead of them being all over the place they're ready to learn they're ready to be engaged and that's going to help in their academics um, we have really acknowledged the whole child. Uh, we have enveloped that attitude where it's not just what they're doing in the classroom that matters, but what they're doing outside of the classroom. And we made sure to find everybody's niche, whether they were awesome at cheer and we just brought that out or where they were an excellent athlete and we brought that out or whether they were doing better at eating better because they're not going to have a sugar crush. And so we just pull all those things and we do whatever it takes. Uh, we continue the expectation of the of physical activity during pandemic times. Um, our kids are, some of them are still at home and we found software where, not, where they're just not gonna watch a video and that's how they're gonna get their grade that's mandated by the state. They're gonna do something. More and more I'm hearing from parents how it's so hard and these kids are, are just, mentally it's, it's challenging them that they don't get to go to birthday parties and, and sometimes parks are closed. And so we made sure that we were gonna do something. These kids, I mean, they're, they're in their homes, they're in their rooms, and we just had to get real creative in how they were going to continue physically. And they're, they just love it. They love going to PE. They love, as you can see, one of the videos down here, um, they're socially distanced, they're wearing their mask, but they're moving. They're moving around, they're jumping around, and they're doing, because we know that that has been successful for us. So when kids are succeeding and thinking positive, the academics are going to follow. And I'm a truly a true believer in that because I saw it. Um, it's very easy for school leaders to say, I don't have time to teach health. I don't have time for all these extra activities. I don't have time to organize intramural sports, but, I have to focus on math. I have to focus on reading. I have to focus on data. And yes, those things are important. I mean, we need to teach our kids those things, but we that's how you get there. I mean, you just make sure that you're enveloping the whole child. And we were a school in the 80s. And when we started doing this, all those, those kids that were at the bottom tiers that we didn't know what to do anymore, we're slowly pulling them up because we found all these other little factors like exercise, like healthy eating, like sports, like activities um, to get them over the edge. And that took our school over the edge into the 90s and then a 92 and a 94 and now a 96. So when a, a leader or an educator says, you know, I don't have time for that, then you're really not doing everything it takes and whatever it takes to ensure that kids succeed. 
So we're going to continue. We're going to continue uh, the things that we're doing because we have seen that it has worked and we have seen that focusing on activity and, and positive lifestyles makes kids better. So again, thank you so much. And um, I hope that more and more schools and more and more educators really embrace um, the physical activity and the healthy eating and just the culture of change that it takes to make kids succeed. Thank you so much, Principal Garza. We do have a few questions that have come into the chat box specifically okay. for you. You can hang on for just a few moments. We'll cover those sure. questions first. And I'll just remind all of those listening in with us today, if you have questions for our presenters, feel free to put them into the chat box. Some of our presenters have had to leave. Um, so if, if we get a question that we can't address right now, um, we'll do our best to find you that answer. But in the meantime, um, for Principal Garza, great work, Principal Garza. Do you share your work and the great outcomes with other principals in the state, like a statewide meeting? I have not. Um, I know that last year I did sign up to present at TEPSA for, it, it was in the summer, but due to COVID, um, it got canceled. So that was going to be one of, one of my first times that I was going to present about this and the things that we have done to, to, you know, to get our school to, to where it is, despite the challenges that, that we have. Um, but no, I have not. Okay. Uh, the next question for Principal, um, well, they said Principal Ortiz, but I think they must mean you. <laughs> you know, today, so we'll we'll assume that. But if if you uh, if this doesn't make sense to you, certainly let me know. Um, being a Brownsville native and a graduate from Pace High School, how has the district supported you and your endeavors in health and wellness, and how can your school become a model for other schools to follow, especially in Brownsville? Um, well, you know, when we started this, it was something that we did here as a school. But yes, we have gotten a lot of support. And, you know, when we go to like the games and things like that, we go with, you know, with other against other schools. And um, they don't, I guess there hasn't been a school per se that has started this intramural at the beginning. More and more are starting. And I want to say, I think it's because, you know, they say they see that that it's possible that it's being done. Um, I'm very blessed that I have, I think a big component here is having the manpower because in elementary, uh, the coaches do not get stipends, they don't get paid. So you have to develop a culture uh, where people are going to buy in and they want to they want to um, help these kids. And so I've been very blessed that I have people that say, oh, I'm gonna do cheerleading. I wanna do sports, I wanna do soccer. That has been a huge success. Um, we have, I, I feel that when my colleagues ask me, I'm very willing to share, I'm very willing to tell them the things that we are doing. And I do see the Brownsville community um, moving more in that direction because of what we see and how all of this stuff is, is gonna help us academically because we're all in the same boat. We all have the same type of children. That's great, thank you. Uh, please keep the questions coming into the chat box if you have more questions for Principal Garza. We do have um, another question here. Is, is there anyone, oh, here we go. Have you worked at all with any farm to school programs at your school? I have not. And I was looking at that at one of the other the sessions prior to this, and um, it was really interesting um, that something that I would probably be one of the other the next thing that I undertake. Um, but no, I have not been involved with any of the, the farm to schools, but I know our kids would love it. Um, we're always looking for things to do that is hands on. Uh, we developed a genius hour here at Ortiz where the kids could take part in like architecture and Zumba and yoga and um, music circles. And so we're always looking to do things outside the box because as we a lot of times people think, oh, it's going to take away from learning. It's going to take away from being in the classroom. But it actually um, it's quite the opposite. And 
kids look forward to coming to school. I had parents that tell me, I don't know why my kid wants to be at school at 7.30 every morning. Well, it's because they enjoy going to running club. They enjoy going to fitness club. My kid doesn't want to be picked up from school. Well, because they have cheer and they have dads and they have intramurals. So it's quite the opposite effect that we're bringing to the kids. And because a lot of times you hear that and that you have that mentality is like, oh, well, I can't take away from the classroom. But now the kids want to come to school. They want to come to school earlier and they want to come to school later. So it works. I know I've certainly seen in our region that COVID has uh, really, really help kids to appreciate even more how much they can enjoy school. Um, yes, they, they absolutely. They're in the classroom with their classmates and able to participate in activities. Um, if others are interested in um, hearing more about working with farmers, local farm, local food initiatives, uh, there there is a lot of amazing work going on throughout the state. I know in our region, we've got uh, two regional food hubs, one located in El Paso, Texas, and one just across the border in New Mexico, um, in South Central New Mexico. And these food hubs are really essential to helping schools connect to local farmers to facilitate that, that farm to school kind of approach, because there are some regulatory issues and there's, um, you know, there, there needs to be some facilitation of communication between what the, what the child nutrition programs need on their end and how how to work with farmers to ensure that the farmers can can deliver the the um, types of produce for example that the school districts may want to use and how to facilitate the planning into the meal schedule so it is possible and there's a lot of great resources throughout our state so if any of you are curious about being connected more to those resources you can certainly email us at live smart texas um, or you can put put your information in the chat box and we can reach out to you and connect you with some more folks that have expertise in that area. Any other questions for any of our presenters right now? Okay, we are going to take just a few brief moments here to have a, a nice little physical activity break. And we do have um, if my co-chair, Dr. Emily Durander, is available, she's going to lead us through a break right now, and then we'll carry on with our next presentation by Dr. Deanna Helscher. All right, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, and I have five minutes, right, to get everybody up and moving? That sounds great. Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. I hope you all have enjoyed the summit so far. Um, we thought we'd practice what we preach and just take a little activity break. So if you have your activity equipment in your home or your office, feel free to just jump right up and do your usual routine. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to do a light stretch and some brisk walking. So we could just do that together. And so let's start out by just raising our hands over our head, reach up and over to your left and hold and to your right and hold. Okay, it's always those shoulders, right, with the Zoom meetings that really just start to ache. So let's go ahead and stretch those out by bringing your right arm across your chest and hold it with your left and just look off to your right. Okay, and then the other side, just bring the left arm across and hold it to your chest and look off to your left. Okay, and then let's just bring your right up arm up over your head like this. Grab your elbow, bring it back and look down. And then your left arm up, hold your elbow, stretch it back and look down. Okay, and then let's just do a few arm circles, ready? Big ones, we'll go big first, backwards, and just make them smaller and smaller. Okay, and then reverse directions. Go forward with your circles, and then bigger, bigger, bigger. 
All right, and we have time for a three minute brisk walk. So if you have a good spot to walk, that's great. Otherwise you can just kind of high step in place or jog in place. Um, I just have my little office treadmill here. So I'm gonna get that fired up. So I know I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but something really interesting is that um, more recent research shows on physical activity that it doesn't have to be some big ordeal, you know, where you pause your life and you carve out an hour for it, um, but you can just do it for a few minutes a day. And so that's something that I love the office treadmill. And actually it was Dr. Leo Wiggum who um, kind of inspired me to get one of these. And, um, you know, just, it's really a great break to just hop on here for five minutes a day when you just need a break, you know, when you're, you've got that fog, maybe you've been writing something or working on a presentation for a while, um, working on some data, you just need a break. Um, and it, you can just hop right on here and it feels good. You get your blood pumping, your, your mind is clear and you can get right back to work. So thanks Leah for the suggestion. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> I'm going to ask if our next speaker, Dr. Helscher, is on the call now. She might join us for a little three-way Q&A before her scheduled speaking time starts. Oh, great. Let's see yes, if she's I'm available. Here. All right. Hi, Deanna. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. We're looking forward to your presentation. I thought some of our listeners might enjoy hearing a little bit of a discussion, and then they can feel free to add questions into the chat box about the importance of behavioral science and the uh, what we know from the behavioral science field and how that can be implemented into programs that we use in our communities to ensure greater impact. Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the things that's difficult, especially when you're doing uh, prevention, is uh, working on uh, behaviors like nutrition and physical activity. In particular, nutrition is not one behavior, but many, many behaviors. Uh, how you eat foods at breakfast is different than how you eat foods at lunch. What kind of foods you eat is different sometimes. Uh, so it really requires people to go through a lot of different behavioral changes. So uh, in a lot of the work we do, we use behavioral theories to kind of set up what we're doing. Um, and what we found is implementing uh, programs that are based on behavioral theory tend to be more uh, robust and have better outcomes. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Durander is kind of uh, agreeing with that. Um, so what we find is it's a behavior, so you have to practice it. So you can't just tell people what to do, but you need to give them the skills to be able to do it. That's a great point. If there are people listening to the call today that work in community settings with programming and they, if they don't have much training in this area and they'd like to seek support for that, do you have any suggestions for them on, on how, to, how to gain more understanding of how to integrate behavior into their behavior change theory into their programs? Well, I think that there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, one way would be to uh, take some college courses, uh, maybe in health promotion. Uh, several of the universities around Texas have uh, really nice uh, programs. Uh, so that's one way. Another way would be uh, to take advantage of some of the webinars that we have and other groups as well have that encourage that. Um, many of the programs you've heard about today have a basis in uh, behavioral science. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, talk to someone in that you might know either at the university level or you can find someone. Uh, a lot of times um, many people have uh, degrees and um, have MPHs, uh, especially um, there's a lot of training that go, has gone on. So a lot of the people that we've seen today have extra training in behavioral sciences. So those are all good ways uh, to go about that. 
Great, those are great ideas, thank you. And I will add to that that our center in El Paso, the UT Health Center for Community Health Impact, has developed a curriculum evaluation tool that community partners can use to work through a curriculum and identify if there are key behavior change theories integrated into that curriculum to ensure that you're maximizing the impact of those lesson plans that you're using. So anyone who's interested in learning more about that is welcome to reach out to me. Uh, we'd be happy to work with you to find a way to apply that tool to any programming that you're doing. All right, well, we are going to move on to the next phase of our presentation. This is our last presentation for the day. And you've just been hearing from our next speaker, Dr. Deanna Helscher is the Regional Dean at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin. She's gonna close out the day for us today with a presentation on the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Survey. Dr. Helscher is the Principal Investigator of the Texas SPAN Survey funded by the Texas Department of State Health Services. And this study established a surveillance system to monitor the prevalence of overweight and obesity in school-aged children in Texas and has been, has been conducted since 2000. I'll turn it over to you now, Deanna. Thanks a lot, Leah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to see you here. Uh, and I'm happy to be giving y'all the uh, first uh, look at the data from the Texas School Physical Activity or the Texas SPAN survey. So as Dr. Wiggum mentioned, we, do, we have done this uh, for five times so far, and these data are kind of hot off the press or hot off the computers, you might say. Uh, so this is the first time that we're presenting this uh, outside of uh, Department of State Health Services. So next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our funding agency, uh, the Texas Department of State Health Services. They've been a great partner throughout all of this, uh, so we really value uh, their input as we move forward with this project. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So they've provided a lot of funding uh, for some of the extras that we do with this project in terms of dissemination of data. And uh, as you can see, uh, kind of riffing on it takes a village, it takes a state to really do a uh, robust obesity prevalence study. So as you can see, we have a lot of partners throughout the state. So I'd like to give a shout out. Uh, some of those might be on the call now. And especially I'd like to thank the district schools, parents, uh, parents and children that participated in the survey. Next slide. I'd also just like to take a, an opportunity to, to thank the research team, in particular, the investigators, uh, Adriana Perez and Nalini Ranjit, and then a couple of really uh, key staff members, uh, Carolyn Smith, who directs SPAN, uh, Nika Akhaven, who is kind of our partner in crime, and then Raja Malkani, who actually helped with many of the analyses and a lot of the slides you're gonna see today. Next slide. Just a, a reminder that this work is part of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And so our vision is healthy children in a healthy world. And so part of that is finding out where we are. And that's where the Texas SPAN data fit in. Next slide. So what is Texas SPAN? Uh, for those of you that have not heard of Texas SPAN before, uh, it's the Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Project. So not to be confused with uh, SPAN, that's uh, the CDC funded projects. Uh, but SPAN measures trends in overweight and obesity in school children in Texas. SPAN also identifies factors associated with obesity. So those include nutrition, physical activity. We look at sleep. Uh, we look at other factors too. Uh, we've added oral health, for example, to the survey within the last couple of times. A lot of the information from SPAN is very useful in the development of targeted programs and policies. So thinking back to what Dr. Wiggum said at the beginning, uh, to kind of inform what we want to do to address overweight and obesity, it's nice to have these data. 
Uh, Texas is a big state, so it helps if we can kind of focus our efforts uh, whenever possible. Next slide. So a little bit about span by the numbers. Uh, so uh, if you could click through um, the number of students who participated, almost 80,000 throughout all the span iterations. We've had uh, 1,560 schools. Of those, uh, we've had 1,250 that are individual schools. So we've been to a few schools more than once uh, in different years. We have 37 publications and 45 uh, presentations with uh, more that are in that are ready to go. Uh, other unique features, SPAN uh, is really um, different from other states. So most other states have data at the uh, state level through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, but that's only for high school kids. So one of the unique aspects of SPAN is we measure kids in two, four, eight, and 11th grade. So we really can look at kids at all different developmental levels. We also have a very diverse population. And one of the things we have that no other state has is a large Texas-Mexico border uh, population that we can compare to the non-border population. Next slide. As I mentioned, we've done SPAN five times. Uh, we're actually gearing up to do a sixth time, uh, hopefully this next school year. Uh, we'll see how it goes with COVID. But we started in 2000 and 2002. Uh, and what you can see here are the grades that we did each year, uh, the public health regions or regional data that we did, and then other assessments that we did for each year. So each year has been a little bit different. Um, we did SPAN in 2004, 2005, um, 2009, 2011, 2015, 2016 was the most recent prior to this. And then these are the data from 2019, 2020. This year, we had to stop data collection early in March. Uh, our last year, we had to stop in March because of the pandemic. And because of that, even though we were, we were uh, our aim was to get all the public health regions and get regional data. We weren't able to collect that those data because we had to stop. Uh, we did end up getting enough of a sample to do border, non-border uh, populations. So we were able to do the weighting by that. Um, so these data are really a good picture of what kids were right before the pandemic. Uh, next slide. So the data collected during SPAN, uh, we directly measure height and weight. So this is different from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey because kids are just asked how tall they are and how much they weigh. Uh, so this is another unique feature of SPAN compared to some states. We have a self-report questionnaire that's administered to the fourth, eighth, and 11th grade students um, it's validated. We've done extensive psychometric testing on it, and it looks at diet, physical activity, knowledge, oral health, uh, several other parameters as well. We have a take-home survey for parents of second grade students. So we measure their BMI, uh, but we ask the parents to report on diet, physical activity, and these other, um, other constructs for the second grade students. And then finally, we assess school policies and practices. So we do this through a school health policy questionnaire. We also analyze the campus improvement plans for nutrition, physical activity, and other health programs. We do vending machine inventory and then signage, uh, looking for health-related signage in the schools. Next slide. So in terms of statewide participation, this last time for SPAN, we surveyed 65 uh, districts and 177 schools. Uh, so that's a little less than what we normally do. Um, you can see the number of students and parents participating uh, and then the population representation. So the data are weighted to represent the Texas population. So altogether, we have uh, about 8,500 kids in the survey 
who represent a population of almost 1.5 million. Next slide. So just a little bit, I'm going to start to show you the data now, but what this is, just to remind you, is a snapshot of the population during the 2019-2020 academic year, um, but we ended data collection in, in March, uh, so it's an incomplete uh, academic year. So we have nutrition physical activity data and measured BMI, as I mentioned. Um, I will show you a few of the obesity-related data. I'm not going to show you a whole lot today, um, but um, so there's more to come. As I said, we just finished these analyses, so we still have a lot of work to do. And just a, a word about this, these data are all weighted at the state level. So when you see these data, they represent the state population. I'm going to show you one slide that's representative of the border, non-border populations. But other than that, all of these data are weighted at the state level, so they're representative. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about the demographics. Um, I didn't show sex because we're evenly divided pretty much uh, girls and boys. Um, the rate, racial ethnic distribution of Texas span, this uh, matches uh, what the racial ethnic distribution is in the state as a whole. So as in last time, we're a majority minority state uh, and the most predominant uh, racial ethnic group is Hispanic. The next slide, please. The median age for Texas span is a little bit younger than what we normally get because we usually do a lot of measurements toward the end of the year. So uh, the median age uh, was about seven, close to nine, close to 13, and close to 16 for each of those uh, grades. Next slide. So just a little bit about weight status in children. Uh, so weight status categories for children age two to 19 are defined using growth curves. And these are percentile cutoffs that were adjusted from previous data. So underweight is considered uh, uh, under the fifth percentile. Healthy weight is between fifth and 85th percentile. Overweight is 85th to below 95th, and obesity is considered 95th percentile or above. Uh, within re recently, there has been another designation of severe obesity, and that's considered 120% of the 95th percentile BMI. So these are not based on a absolute percentile, but based on percentiles of previous populations. Um, because of the way kids grow, you have to change those uh, for how old they are and what sex they are. The next slide. Just to give you a little bit of context here, Healthy People 2030 uh, recently came out with objectives for uh, child and adolescent obesity. So these are new as of um, December, I think they came out. But nutrition and weight status objective uh, Four of Healthy People 2030 is to reduce the proportion of, ch of, of children and adolescents with obesity. So at baseline, 17.8% of children and adolescents aged 2 to 19 had obesity in 2013, 2016. And the target for Healthy People 2030 is 15.5%. So one other thing to know about this is some of the Healthy People 2030 objectives are considered leading health indicators. And so those are weighted a little bit more heavily. And this objective is a leading health indicator for Healthy People 2030. Next slide, please. So here is the data, here are the data for weight status by grade level. So if you look across, uh, the orange is underweight, the green is healthy weight, um, the blue is overweight, and then the red is obesity. 
So if you look at these across here, what one of the things that you will see is uh, across all four grades that we looked at, the, uh, the prevalence of obesity is 22% or greater. So if we look at these, we did see an increase in fourth and 11th grade from when we conducted SPAN in 2015-2016. And I'll show you that a little bit more clearly in just a second. Next slide. So here is that slide I mentioned about uh, looking at the border counties versus non-border counties. So this is the percent of students who have obesity. So this is for fourth, eighth, and 11th grade. We didn't do it for second grade. So the orange is the non-border population and uh, green is the border population. So the border population are the counties that are contiguous with um, the Texas-Mexico border, uh, according to the La Paz Agreement. So one of the things that you see here is there are differences between border and non-border. We have not done significance testing on these yet, uh, so I will get back to you uh, in a few months with those data, with that information. Uh, but as you can see, there's a difference in each of the grade levels. One thing that was different is it, last time we did the survey uh, span in 2015-2016, at grade 11, there was almost an 11, 10-point uh, difference, absolute difference between border and non-border uh, prevalence of obesity. And here it's a lot closer than it was then. Next slide. So these slide, this slide here shows obesity among boys by grade and racial ethnic group. And if you look at this, uh, African-American boys are orange, the Hispanic boys are green, and then the white and other boys are blue. So if you look at it, the highest prevalence of obesity uh, is among Hispanic boys in all grade levels. Um, interestingly enough, the African-American and white other boys tend to be pretty close in terms of the prevalence of obesity. Next slide. This slide shows obesity among girls by grade and racial ethnic group. So uh, the colors represent the same racial ethnic group. Here, the uh, African-American girls tend to have the highest prevalence of uh, obesity. And this is pretty common with what we've seen before. So these trends are similar to what we've seen in, in previous span. Um, in previous spans, um, one of the things that we did notice though is the prevalence of uh, obesity among African-American girls in second grade is especially high uh, this round of span. Next slide. So here are the trends in child obesity in Texas, looking from when we did SPAN in 2000, 2002, all the way to 2019, 2020. So uh, the orange is grade four, the green is grade eight, and the blue is grade 11. So one of the things that you see is there's a quadratic trend uh, among grade four. So we did see a dip in 2004, 2005, 2009, uh, 2011, and then it went back up. And in 2019, 2020, it's exceeded where we were in 2000, 2002. In 2004, and to some extent in two, uh, 2009, 2011, there were a lot of initiatives that the state did. That's uh, between the time that coordinated school health uh, legislation was passed, um, so there was a lot of ramping up about it. Uh, Susan Combs had a lot of initiatives going on through the Texas Department of Agriculture uh, aimed at schools. And then uh, certain groups, especially in El Paso, for example, had uh, very robust program efforts in the community. So what we've seen is uh, kind of uh, a little bit of a backsliding with the fourth graders. With the eighth graders, they've kind of have an upward trend. Um, and with the 11th graders, we really see that upward, upward trend. 
as I said, we haven't done significant testing on this yet, but these are all pretty alarming uh, increases to see. If y'all click through, uh, yeah. So healthy people 2030 goal, as I mentioned previously, is 15.5%. So you can see we're well above that. And then if with the next click, you'll see the NHANES data. So this is the national data that's at 17.8% for kids two to 19. So we're well above that. So Texas kids uh, have a higher prevalence of obesity than kids in the United States in general. The next slide. So this is a rather alarming slide for me. So when you look at children with severe obesity in Texas uh, this time around, what you find is that uh, it ranges from 9% to 11.5% of the students. So severe obesity, as we've uh, classified it here, is a sub, um, is a subunit of the, uh, is a subgroup of the obesity class. So um, this is kind of alarming to us because if you look at the US data for six to 11 year olds, the prevalence of severe obesity is 5.8%. So we're pretty much almost double that in second and fourth grade. For kids, for adolescents who are 12 to 19 years old, um, the prevalence of severe obesity in the U.S. is 7.6%. And as you can see, it's 9% and 10.4% among Texas kids. All of these have seen an increase since 2015, 2016, except for eighth grade. Eighth grade is pretty much at the same uh, prevalence as it was in 2015, 2016. Next slide. So now I'm going to transition to talking about a few uh, of the dietary uh, questions, which were very interesting, uh, the results this year. So we, on the SPAN survey, we ask about diet questions and we ask about yesterday consumption. So it captures the uh, school week consumption. So it's not necessarily Saturday and Sundays that we're looking at. Um, we also are looking at the group levels. So these are uh, prevalence uh, figures for the consumption of the various food groups we'll talk about. And uh, these do not provide information about any one individual child. So it's rather the group as a whole. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the number of time vegetables were consumed per day per by grade, 2019-2020. Uh, and this classifies vegetables like the dietary guidelines or my plate does. So it includes starchy, yellow, orange, green, uh, other vegetables, and then beans, legumes. So we have separate questions that ask about each of those. So if you could click again, please. So what I'd like for you to look at with the dietary slides, uh, they all uh, have a similar color scheme. So uh, orange is for none on the previous day, green is for one time, blue is for two times, and red is for three or more times. So even though we have about a quarter of the students who are consuming vegetables three or more times, What's more alarming is we have more than a third of students, if you look across all grades, who are not consuming any vegetables on the previous day. So uh, because that's a major uh, recommendation, that is something that we need to look at. And uh, Dr. Wiggum mentioned that about access to healthy foods. Next slide. This one shows the number of times that fruit was consumed per day per grade. And so this is, uh, when we assess this, we're looking at fruit juice and fruit consumption. So one of the things that we did see is we did see an increase again in the number of students who reported consuming no fruit on the previous day. Uh, the one exception was the fourth grade. So the fourth grade data overall look a little better than they did uh, during the last span. Next slide. 
So another recommendation we make a lot is to limit sugary beverages. So this uh, as looks at the number of times sugary beverages were consumed per, per day by grade. And if you could click through again. Uh, so in this case, I'm gonna show you the number of uh, students who consume three or more servings a day. So sugary beverages here includes regular sodas, coffees and teas with sugar in it, uh, fruit drinks, sports drinks, um, flavored milks, and energy drinks. So we did add flavored milks and energy drinks this year, and we did see an increase in the number of students who consumed uh, three or uh, sugary beverages three or more times on the previous day. Uh, so this is definitely an area that we can work on in the prevention space in terms of uh, interventions. Next slide. So this is some kind of good news out of SPAN. This is the first year that we've asked about the number of times that water was consumed. And one of the things we found is there's a significant percentage of children who are consuming water three or more times a day. So uh, that's actually good news and maybe something that we could switch kids from sugary beverages to water. So uh, we were happy to see this. Next slide. We also assessed the number of times sweet and savory snacks were consumed per day by grade. So uh, if you could click through again, um, what I'd like to focus on here are the number of these snack foods that were consumed three or more times a day. And as you can see, uh, over 40% of Texas school children consume these sweet and savory snacks three or more times a day. Uh, these include candy, frozen desserts, cakes, uh, brownies, french fries, chips, and snack bars. So this year we did add a question about snack bars um, because they're very popular foods that kids eat, uh, but a lot of them have a lot of sugar in them. So really when you look at this, you'd almost want to see this and the vegetable uh, slides kind of uh, reversed where kids were eating vegetables like this and sweet and savory snacks similar to how they're consuming vegetables. So uh, this is another point of intervention I think that we can look at. Next slide. So on this slide, uh, we asked the kids, how many days were you physically active for a total of at least 60 minutes per day? So as uh, Tom Ferry was talking about for kids being active and being outside, we have other questions that we assess this. But this is kind of looking at how many days a week were you active for at least 60 minutes? So if you could click through once, Thanks. Uh, so the orange was fewer than five days, and then the green is five days or more. So the guideline is for uh, every day that you should be physically active for at least 60 minutes. So we set our, uh, whether they met it at five days, so uh, most of the days. But as you can see, around 70% of students did not meet uh, the physical activity guidelines. Uh, on the previous on the previous week. So instead of uh, per day, this was assessed per week. Uh, we did see a little bit of improvement among fourth graders, but when we measured in 2015, 2016, we saw uh, the second, eighth, and 11th grades were between 50 and 60% of them who were not meeting the guidelines. So this has really increased quite a bit. And um, what's a little scary is that it's it was right before the pandemic. Uh, so we'll see where it goes uh, when we're able to assess them afterwards. Next slide. So a little bit about conclusions and a little bit of, of the bad news. So school children in Texas have high rates of obesity. And so we really need to kind of uh, go back to um, the beginning and kind of increase our focus on child obesity prevention across all grades. Um, we really need to instill these good eating habits and physical activity habits in the kids at an early age. 
Uh, what's also scary, as I mentioned before, is that approximately 10% of Texas children already have severe obesity. So uh, those are ones that we'll need to get a little bit more aggressive uh, with uh, weight management type programs. Approximately 30% of uh, Texas school children don't consume vegetables and about 25% do not consume fruits um, daily. About 45% of Texas students eat three or more snack foods a day. About 30% of school children drink three or more sugary beverages per day. And then about 70% of Texas school children are not meeting minimum physical activity guidelines. Next slide. There are some good news though. Uh, about 45% of students drink uh, three or more glasses of water a day. Uh, I didn't show you these data, but we did ask a question about did students help prepare foods at home? And a significant number of students help prepare meals at least sometimes. And this number increases when you look at the 11th and 8th graders compared to the, the younger kids. So there's another place I think that we have room for intervention for uh, cooking and food type interventions. Um, Texas SPAN 2019-2020 provides data that can inform interventions. So I think we've got uh, guidance here in terms of what needs to be done. And I can tell you that more data are to come. So we're planning on uh, doing a little bit more examination of these data looking at more trends over time, uh, and also uh, setting this up as part of our, our SPAN Data Explorer. So you can go online and kind of uh, look for the state level data. Next slide. So what can Texas do to address obesity based on what we've seen with SPAN? So kind of to uh, take it back to how Dr. Wiggum started the day, uh, one of the things we can do, if you could click through, um, is access to healthy, affordable foods and food environments. Uh, secondly, is access to safe opportunities and environments for physical activity. And then last is access to effective prevention programs and treatment management of obesity. So as Dr. Wiggum said, we really need programs, uh, policies, and environments that really uh, lead us, make it easier to consume healthy foods and to be active. And if you could click one more time, I think that this is a nice quote to end with, and I've heard it reiterated several times uh, throughout today's presentations. Alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. So it really is important to have a group effort like this, like Live Smart Texas and the partnership and all the other groups that you've heard speak today kind of move forward on this together uh, because we all need to do it for the health of Texas and the health of the US. Next slide. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's any questions. Well, we just um, put an invitation in the chat box to have people submit their questions. So we'll give a little time here. Here's one. Does every state have a model and a summit like this? I'm from New York. So I can, I can start with that. Um, well, welcome. Thanks for joining us from New York. This is the first year that our state has had a, had a statewide World Obesity Day Summit. World Obesity Day is actually relatively new as well. The first World Obesity Day happened in 2020. So every year on March 4th now moving forward is World Obesity Day. Um, we, and I'll turn it over to Deanna here in a moment to talk about what Texas has done some in the past. So you can look on the World Obesity Day website if you just Google World Obesity Day um, to see what's happening in different parts of the world. If you wanna see if there are activities in New York. You can also look through the, uh, the Obesity Society, which is a, an organization, professional organization of scientists and clinicians who study and advocate, um, advocate for obesity. And there will be um, information through that organization about 
other professionals in New York that focus on obesity. So I'm not, I can't tell you for sure if there's a statewide summit like this one, but um, it is a for World Obesity Day specifically, that is a relatively new thing for Texas. And Deanna, if you'd like to say a little bit about what, what your team has done in the past as well. Yeah, for several years here at the center, together with Live Smart Texas, we've had uh, Texas Obesity Awareness Week, which in Texas is the second week in September. So uh, we typically have had events. Uh, they've been in person, uh, not virtual, uh, as have uh, most events prior to the past year. Um, but we would usually have a keynote speaker. And for those, we would recognize uh, we had some youth awards and some uh, organization and individual awards for those who had been doing uh, excellent work in Texas. So we've had to pivot that a little bit. Uh, so uh, we have been doing something, uh, but this year's is new. All right, thank you. If you have any more questions for Dr. Helsher, feel free to put them into the chat box. I will also bring to everyone's attention the earlier message in the chat box. For those interested in CHES credits, you will receive a certificate of attendance two hours after the summit ends. Please reply to that email requesting CHES and we will get your uh, two advanced level credits situated. And you will, you will all receive notification about two hours from now with a link to the to the webinar if you'd like to watch the recording. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come into the chat. Deanna, are there any other comments you want to make with regards to the summit today or any other aspects of your presentation? And thank you for that presentation and for all the hard work you and the rest of the team do to collect the stand data. They, as you said, they're so important for helping us decide how to focus efforts around program and policy work. So thank you for that. That was a great presentation. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just I wanted to thank Live Smart Texas and the partnership for inviting me to be here today. Um, we will be updating several of our child health status reports now that we've got the new data. So those uh, that we've developed, uh, they're at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living website. Uh, we have a lot of one-pagers that utilize SPAN data. Uh, we will be updating those uh, as they were based on the 2015-2016 data. So look for updates on that. Um, if you want to uh, subscribe to our Twitter feed for the center, uh, we can provide updates as, as uh, we get those done. Okay, great. And I will add to the thank yous. I would like to thank uh, Live Smart Texas, my co-chair, Emily Durander, and the steering committee members who presented today to tell us about the work going on around the state. Um, I would also like to thank Michelle Smith for coordinating the presenters through the Partnership for Healthy, Air Tex for Healthy Texas um, aspect of the program. And I'd like to give a, a special thanks to Shelby Flores Thorpe from the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living for her help with the coordination through Live Smart Texas that helped get us here today. And a big, big thanks to Kate Neal, who keeps all the engines running in the background. She's the communication specialist from the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And Kate, we couldn't do it without you. Thanks for making the experience so flawless for everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here today. We're going to wrap up now. Uh, feel free to put any other questions or follow-up information you might need in the chat box or send us an email. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.